All right. Hi, May. Hello, everyone. <laughs> hey, great to have everybody here. Thank you for joining us. So, May, we are on our fourth live stream, and mm -hmm. today you're going to be painting the wing. That's correct? Yeah, finally. <laughs> awesome. Cool. All right, well, take it away. Mm -hmm. So, I'm not going to be, you know, attempting the whole wing tonight, but I'll probably just be doing the shadows. So, like the top section. Um, where it's a bit darker and probably most of the part that's overlapping with the figure. So like that mysterious transparent bit, I'm probably going to be covering a fair amount too. Um, so yeah, so on my palette, it's a bit messy today because it was a little bit hectic getting into this. But um, in the top left corner here, um, that's supposed to match the flat I have down already. Um, like overall, that kind of washed out peachy color. Um, and then I have kind of a string of values here going into the shadows. Um, this is like a cooler tone that is kind of overlapping the, sh um, the shoulder um, and that kind of transparent part. And then these two are kind of, this is like a cooler and slightly darker version of the flat. So that should be a good um, like intermediate color between like a lot of different things. And then I have these two like really warmer tones um, because there's some interesting like chromatic variations in the part where it overlaps with the shoulder um, and just kind of in between some shadow and light areas. And if I have to make more colors as I go, I will do that, as you saw me do last time. Um, so yeah, I think I'm just gonna start with the darkest value and then go lighter, as usual. Um, or at least that was the plan last time, but obviously I didn't follow it. But um, yeah, that is going to be where I start off tonight. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned something about the wings being transparent. What's that? Yeah. Um, so. I just took the wing as like an image from Photoshop and you know it was like nice and solid, very normal standard. And um, I thought I'd just like mix it up a little bit in Photoshop and I kind of, instead of using it as like a normal layer, I changed the blending mode to be um, something else so that it kind of affects the way it looks um, when it like overlaps with something. Um, so as you can see, like the top left shoulder is still like partially exposed like underneath um, the wing, so yeah, it's just like I was just messing with some effects in Photoshop and thought it would be interesting. Cool, and you'll be painting mm -hmm. that into this painting. Yes. Awesome. Yeah, it's in the reference. It's like kind of subtle, mm -hmm. but um, yep. Yeah, I can see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if anyone has any questions for May, you are more than welcome to ask your questions in the chat, and I will be able to read them aloud to May, and you can have a little conversation going while she's painting. Mm -hmm. I'm not following this transfer like super strictly, even though I can still see it. Because um, wings are organic anyway, so we don't want the edges to look super mechanical and forced. So I'm just kind of loosely, well not loosely, but um, generally blocking out the shape of this value. And if I need to, I'll paint over it with another one later. It's not too difficult. Um, this is just kind of to build in more context for the rest of the values and colors that I'll be putting on later. Um, so they're kind of just making landmarks for me. Everyone's just peacefully watching. <laughs> yeah, very peaceful live stream nice. to start us off. And actually, there's a bit of a glare right oh. where you're painting, May. No, you're mm -hmm. good. You keep doing your thing. Okay. But Don't I'm going to just get up here and try to adjust the lighting okay. for everyone. So I'll be back in a second.
All right, well, I adjusted the light, and mm -hmm. we can't go any higher uh, without light bulb. So, May, if you, if you feel comfortable, you could mm -hmm. also lower the easel down a little bit for us and see if that works. Whatever's comfortable for you, and okay. we'll just make do. Does this help? Or? Like, this is fine overall. So. Okay. Yeah, we'll just keep it as it is. Okay. I want to make sure that you're comfortable as you're painting. Yeah. Yeah, so that we do have a glare on that section, everybody, um, but that is one of her darkest values, I believe, mm -hmm. that she's painting with. Okay, thank you, Harry. Harry's head looks okay from here. That's it's good to know. It'll be going up one value, so it's just the color right next to it on the palette. Um, a lot of the areas between that are um, that I'm going to be using these two values for are like kind of overlapping, so I don't really take too much care to like clean my brush. I kind of just covered it with this one, um, since the difference is like very subtle. So. All right, well, I'll get us started with some conversations here. Mm -hmm. So here's a question for you, May. Mm -hmm. Which one of all of the paintings that you've done, <laughs> which one is your favorite and why? This is a great segue into something, isn't it? <laughs> um, oh, really? I think so. Oh, yeah. awesome. Okay. Well, okay, I'll start with my second favorite, and then we can go on to the first favorite. Um, cool. So I think my... Oh wait, there's like three contenders for second favorite. <laughs> um, let me think. Probably, yeah. I mean, I've mentioned it before. It's not my best, like it's not like my highest quality painting, but I do just enjoy it the most as an image. Um, it's capture. It's like, it's like my one of my big paintings. It's the four by three foot one, um, with like an angel and there's like giant hands in the back and like a huge wave and he's being like, kind of caught between the two giant hands. Um, so I just think it's like really mm -hmm. dynamic, really fun. Um, the wave was like super fun to paint, even though it took like three passes. <laughs> um, and obviously the wings were a very fun, like compositional and visual addition. So I just really like that piece, even though I know it's like not the best um, that I've created so far. Mm. But um, as for my first favorite piece, it's actually, should we just go into it? Or? Yeah, Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I just bring it out or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, bring it up. <laughs> All right, so my first favorite piece is something I've mentioned a few times already. Ah, uh, yes. Lately. This is the one that we talked about last week, and um, we had actually talked about um, prints for this one, mm -hmm. and we had gauged interest, and uh, yeah, definitely uh, lift it up and show us what, you're, what we're talking about here. So last week, we got, yeah, a lot of people, uh, if you can step over more, mm -hmm. yeah, and then lean it down just a little bit. Yeah, awesome. Um, so yeah, so a lot of people had expressed interest in actually getting a print of this May, and mm -hmm. uh, which of course I told you about earlier. Mm -hmm. So that's super cool. And um, yeah, maybe we can, you have some kind of link set up, right? I do. Okay, you yeah. wanna tell us about that? It's, um, so I made a little Google form for anyone who's interested in getting a print um, based on the response we got last week. And um, it's just three parts, so name, email, and then shipping address, and then you just choose um, which print you want, basically, or like how many. Um, and the print is going to be available on, I think it's matte paper, and then also it's going to be approximately full size, so this is two by three feet, um, but it's going to be about 90% of that size, just so we have a little border around everything, um, in case you want to frame it or hang it or mount it or anything like that, so yeah. That's pretty much the form. And um, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this I'm going to drop favorite. in um, to just help out those who are interested. I'm going to drop in a link that May gave me. And it's just a simple Google form. Um, you can put that painting down. I've got okay. it up here. Um, 
just a simple Google form where uh, you can just fill out info and, ex and kind of, yeah, figure out the, where, are there multiple print options or is it just the one? What's I think the... it's just the one. Okay, now. and yeah. so what kind of print is it going to be? It's on matte paper, matte paper. and it's 90% full size, just accommodating for a white border around it on the image. So it's more easy to like mount or do anything else with it. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And I can talk about the painting itself too. Um, I just, I mean, I like pretty much compose the entire thing out of like Shutterstock images and everything. So like the planet in the back and like that giant wave in the back as well. And like the really fancy rocks up front and just like the water and the guns and like the figures and everything. It's just like super dynamic and it was really, really fun to paint. Because um, there are just so many like different textures, different values, different like groupings of colors throughout the entire painting. Um, yeah, just very enjoyable and yeah, definitely, definitely yeah held myself to a much higher standard. Um, before I started it, Kevin was talking to me about it, and he was like, "There's no reason that this shouldn't be pretty much like on the same level as the illustration that like he just completed on like his live streams, um, like the science science fiction illustration." And so, definitely kept that in mind, and um, I think I delivered pretty well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm quite pleased with it. So. Yeah, I think technically this is one of your strongest pieces, and also compositionally, <laughs> it's just awesome. Thank you. <laughs> like, I, I love that skull in the front. Mm -hmm. I've got a nice little, uh, we're kind of scrolling through it nice and slow right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And the name of it is Betrayal? Yeah. That was like the original concept I had um, when I was composing it um, because like all the figures are in the same uniform but obviously the one in front has is out for the two in the back but, mm. um, and he's like masked and everything so mm -hmm. originally I was like ah, I just want to paint like more figures in like a more engaging scene and then I was like ooh the most sinister thing I can come up with off the top of my head is like betrayal so yeah I thought it yeah. would be cool. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And what's the price of the print? It'll be um, about $100 plus shipping. So we'll awesome. probably, like, based off of responses, it'll we'll come up with, like, an aggregate, like, shipping cost. So, like, everyone kind of pays a similar amount. Um, so, yeah. Great. Very cool, May. Thank you. <laughs>
compared to the relationships that were on the palette, mm -hmm. like it, it's, they seem so different from each other. And I thought, man, I think I'm starting off this painting too dark and just all these doubts just like came in like crazy. And, and I, so I, you know, so I kind of just like stared at it and I'm like, okay, <laughs> got to think this one through, mm -hmm. you know, did I choose a poor value here to start? Do I need to re remix my colors? But now the paint is already like going to start drying on the, <laughs> on the canvas. And mm -hmm. so I'm kind of just becoming quickly overwhelmed. Yeah. And, um, Kevin was nearby, mm -hmm. um, since I was at the art school and, um, but I didn't want to ask him for help because at this point I was like already, you know, doing my own professional work. Right. So I ended up just staring at the painting for, I kid you not, like half an hour <laughs> doing absolutely nothing. Just like <laughs> stroking my beard, <laughs> pretending that I'm trying Marinating. to solve a complicated problem when, when really I was just afraid. Marinating in uh, intrusive thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I get that. So Kevin, of course, notices this and eventually he kind of comes over and just stands next to me and stares at the portrait. You <laughs> just both nothing. stared at it together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so finally I'm like, Kevin, I don't know what to do. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? I feel like I've ruined this painting. <laughs> like I, at that point I was so overwhelmed. Yeah. And I just put down a few marks, you know. Yeah. It definitely gets worse yeah. if you just like sit there in it. Yeah. Okay. That's also like the easiest thing to do. So you're just kind of stuck. So Kevin, he's he's quiet for a little while. He's just staring at the portrait. <laughs> and he slowly walks up to the easel. Mm -hmm. He picks up my brush, looks down at the palette. He confirms, this is the shade you were using? He's like, yeah. Takes a little bit of the medium, mixes it in with the same shade, exactly what I did. He starts scribbling on the face, <laughs> exactly what I did. Right. And for some reason, <laughs> it just made sense <laughs> because he was doing it and I wasn't. <laughs> and he, he just turned back with a smile and was like, what's wrong? <laughs> uh, I, I walked over, I said, give that back. <laughs> Took the brush back and just, I carried on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's just funny. funny how like I was actually doing everything right, but I was just so afraid and I let the fear mm -hmm. completely paralyze me. Overwhelmed with existing not as Kevin Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Me too. So I'll never forget that. And that reminds me sometimes when I am confused or not sure about what next step to take or, mm -hmm. or maybe I, I blow out of proportion. Like if I do this one thing, then it's going to create a chain reaction to the <laughs> end result of the painting. And do I want that to happen? And Mm -hmm. I forget how forgiving oil painting is and you can, you know, adjust on the fly and everything. And mm -hmm. so I just remind, remind myself to take, to trust the process one step at a time. And uh, that helps me now immensely. Stabilize, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Me too. It's nice to have like history and stories like that that kind of just take Still you back. you, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, Eddie just made a great point. If one is always learning, one will always feel like a beginner. That's really Absolutely. good. I'm trying to think if I have like really vivid, like similar memories. But, um... I feel like I've just, I'm just always in this state of, like, either I'm just swinging between, like, a lot of self-doubt or just, like, a lot of confidence. And then a lot of self-doubt and then a lot of confidence. Like, Why is that? Tell me more. I just, um, I mean, I just tend to, like, overthink a lot, just, like, in general. And so, like, when I'm working, I'm always, like, as I'm working, I'll, like, see things that I, like, miss or that I, should, like, should do in, like, a next pass or, like, in the next few minutes or something. And then, like, I'll catch it and I'll, like, do it. And then I'll just keep seeing more and more things. So the constant going between, like, catching it and doing it and then, like, seeing, like, more inadequacies, like, always keeps me going back and forth a lot. Um, so it's, it can be very exhausting sometimes. Um, Cause it's like, I don't know, like, 
is it good that I'm seeing so many things? Or not, you know, because it's like, oh, I'm like able to perceive my flaws, but like I can never seem to be able to fix them all properly. Um, so mm -hmm. there's that back and forth in my silly little brain a lot. <laughs> But I mean, ultimately, it's good, I think, to like constantly be critical, as long as it's like constructive, you know, not just like, oh, this is something I'm missing and doing wrong, and I'm terrible because of it. Like, instead of doing that, just like take it and try to improve it by solving the problem that you see. Mm -hmm. um, so it's important to just like not get stuck, because you have to remember your goal is not to like be your own biggest hater, <laughs> but to like, yeah. you know. Um, Build yourself up as much as you can and fulfill your potential, et cetera. Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it can also be tougher when, like, as you're learning and accumulating more information, then yeah. you feel like you have to juggle more. Mm -hmm. Like, you learn a new piece of information, and um, that new piece of information, if you if you like, if it's if it's so new and exciting to you, you might over prioritize it, yeah, for and sure. forget that there are other more fundamental essentials that matter much more than that little thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but if it's new and it and it feels like something we haven't explored explored before, then we, maybe we're thinking, oh man, like how do I do this and how do I merge it in? How do I integrate it with all these other things? Um, yeah, so it can become. I think it actually can become harder as you're, which then again just points to that journey of like of mastery because the masters knew how to simplify things mm -hmm. and they were, and they showed that in their paintings. Uh, Bill just asked me, how's my epic painting coming along? <laughs> it is coming along. Um, it's quite, quite spectacular. Yeah, quite epically I might say. <laughs> um, I'm actually staring at it now it's off to the right, but uh, not on screen intentionally. Aww. Um, yep, still uh, waiting for the <clears> client <throat> to see it when it's done. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy with how it's progressing so far. And uh, even when I'm not painting it, I'm like painting it in my head. <laughs> and it's just so much fun. Yeah, I love it when that happens with the painting. It's just, you just keep it going in your brain, even when you're like just driving or like sitting at home or something. Mm -hmm. You should show them your palette. The palette? The, 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 the massive, chunk, yeah, chunk brick of, of paint. <laughs> you don't know what we're talking about. I'm <laughs> I mean, we could. If Do you want, want to? I can grab it. Sure. Well, let's let's ask the crowd. <laughs> if, let, let us know, viewers, if you'd like to see <laughs> the, the palette without seeing the actual painting of uh, the painting I'm working on. That would be OK. Get a, get a taste of what the colors are looking like. Teaser trailer. Yeah. Really working the crowd tonight, huh? <laughs> yeah, you know, got to help everyone stay engaged. <laughs> uh, so Eddie said, sometimes a drawing doesn't look as good as I thought it would, as I saw it in my mind. But if I leave it aside for a few months and come back to it, it looks better than I initially thought. Yeah, that's absolutely true. We mm -hmm. can become blind and, and also think like really critically of our work. Mm -hmm. Um, in the moment, sometimes it'll it'll take me like as much as a, like a few months or a year even to really appreciate a painting that I worked really hard at. Yeah. Um, all right, we're getting some yeses, so I think it's uh, yeah. If you wouldn't mind grabbing it for me, thank you. And then you can hand it over to to May. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> can I see it? Uh, you're gonna have to raise it a little bit higher if you can. I don't know if that's possible. Like if you can, it. can you kind of grab it by the ends? I'm it scared. Should, it should stick on. How's that? Yeah, and then a little bit higher, even if you can. So right by May's thumb. If you want to try to point to it with your thumb there. This one. Right there. Yeah. yeah. That is a massive. <laughs> Um, gl glob of blue paint. 
And that's really like the main color of the sky, the clouds, the water, um, just everything. It's sort of the, the unifying element to the painting. So it's a very, very blue painting and it's gonna have these bright oranges from these torches on the, on the boat. So that is probably one of the biggest challenges of this painting right now is actually how do I work with blue and orange and let them marry together really nicely and complement each other without getting green and mud mm. in the process. So well, we've yet to see how that's gonna go. Um, and then there's that really bright blue up there as well. And that is the color of um, some of my clouds that are being lit by the moon right now. Um, and I even have some pinks in there to, to sort of subtly play around with some, uh, I don't know, color harmonies or something like that. They look nice. Yeah. So. Color chords. I don't know. I'm just saying things. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just going to put it back. <sighs> yeah, it's a pretty heavy glob of paint, so <laughs> that's why May was a little extra careful not to drop it. It's substantial. Back to this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Commercial break. Right. We're here for May, okay, everybody? <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the, the spotlight, but uh, one day we'll, we'll do some of my stuff. doing okay so I moved on to my third darkest value um, it's a little bit warmer a little more chromatic as well so I'm able to use that um, in places that are overlapping the shoulder a little bit um, because up in this area that I covered um, there are some like edges of feathers that are kind of pulling away and catching light um, and those are like about three, two or three values away. So I'm just letting them be for now. Um, and I'll get to them when I get to those values. So these, so this value is like probably the lightest shadow-ish, um, like the lightest cast shadow. Um, and so they're gonna be more applicable in like this lighter area slash more transparent area, quote unquote. Now, I know in your previous painting of a, with a wing figure, mm -hmm. you were playing around a bit with paint density, especially in your shadows. Um, are you... Which one? Um, it was of the figure who's kind of leaning Andrew? back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Are you going to be doing something similar for this one or not really? It looks like it now. <laughs> um, I don't know. Maybe. I think... The rest of the painting is like pretty smooth and like doesn't have a lot of like paint texture on it. So I'll see if it like fits. Um, but usually that like kind of gives a heavier effect to whatever you're looking at, um, whatever is like being rendered that way, at least in my experience. And so I'm not sure if I want the wings to feel heavy or like very like light and airy yet. Um, I mean, since the painting overall is kind of dark, I think heavy would fit, but also it's like, I don't want that to be overkill as well. Um, like two heavy elements. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure yet. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this painting I'm showing right now, it has uh, a lot of transparency. I think the blues were transparent and then the, the lights were more opaque. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Here's a question for you, May, mm -hmm. from Bill. Yeah. How much do you stray from your references based on what you were talking about before? What was I talking about before? Um, um, I can't recall. In general, I stick pretty close to my references throughout the process um, towards 
the end, though, like after I cover the canvas and everything, or the panel, usually. Um, if I want to make an adjustment, like overall, to like colors of like certain areas or scenes or um, like subjects, then I'll do that. But um, usually I don't like explicitly plan on it from the very beginning to kind of stray from my reference. Have you made any intentional deviations from this reference so far? Um, I don't think so. Not yet. Mm -hmm. I think I added a little more, a little more blue in the background than is like present, but I like it. Mm -hmm. And I guess also like the background, um, like the edge that goes along like this wing at least and around most of the figure, um, it's like the exact same value as like this darker stuff over here, but it's like a very chromatic red. Mm -hmm. And so that's definitely like not in the picture, but I really like how it looks. Um, there's like a very subtle kind of glow to it um, that it adds to the figure. Mm -hmm. So I kind of just decided to do that on the fly. Cool. Mm -hmm. Everything right now is pretty approximate. Um, again, I'm just trying to lay in kind of landmarks for general values and shapes, and I'll make them more precise when more things are in place. So I think we'll be moving over to this. Here is, yeah, this cooler color, so I can cover most of that shoulder. Oh, where the wing's overlapping. It's looking a little bit light to me. So, probably grab some of this and mix it in and see what that does. I think that's a bit better. Yeah. Here's a question from Eddie. Mm -hmm. May, do you get carpal tunnel or repetitive strain injury after a series of long sessions at the easel? Um, not yet. <laughs> um, however, the other day, earlier this week, I did do a very large transfer for like six hours straight, so that like wasn't fun. <laughs> mm. My hand was definitely sore afterwards, but like kind of by the time I went to bed, it was like fine, so. That was my fault. I shouldn't have done it in like one sitting. That's just like silly. Um, but I was like, girl, I want to like get this part of the painting like done within like one day or whatever. Because um, I think of stuff in days, not in hours. Um, which is like good for moving stuff forward, but it's also bad for your wrists if you're doing a transfer for like six hours straight. Um, but overall, when I'm just painting, I don't really get too much like pain or irritation. Um, but the day right after doing that transfer for six hours, I then painted the flats over that like massive canvas for another like six hours. So kind of back to back, that was like a very bad idea. Um, that's on me. So, but then again, like that was fine by the time I like went to bed mostly. So, yeah, I still wouldn't like you know advise it though. Would you do it again yourself? Mm. If I really, really wanted to work on a painting, like, yeah. <laughs> but at this point, like, I know the repercussions, so I kind of mm -hmm. just own it. Um. Yeah, pacing yourself is important. Mm -hmm. Kevin's like, if you're gonna do that, like at least take like Advil or something beforehand. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm not gonna take Advil to paint. That's silly. Um, maybe it isn't. I do joke about it though. Um, I like text my friends. I'm like, just got back from the studio, carpal tunnel time. And they're like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> All right.
right, I'm going to ask a question here for you, May. Mm -hmm. It's too and peaceful tonight. Okay. Yeah, it's very <laughs> peaceful, so mm -hmm. but that's all good. So um, this question is a question that everyone can answer. We'd love to hear everyone's thoughts in the chat. If you could paint anyone's portrait, who would it be? So imagine this is like a full process, right? So you're meeting <laughs> with the person, you get to talk with them, mm -hmm. maybe even, I know some, like Kevin has lived with uh, the people he's gonna paint for a little while to really get to know them. Um, maybe you're painting them from life, so you're seeing them in that way. Um, so if you could paint anyone's portrait, who would it be? Let's hear your answers. Um, that's an interesting question. I, I'm not sure, because I didn't think about like the living with the other person aspect too, because that's like a very different ball game, I think. Probably a celebrity of some sort. Um, maybe like a favorite author of mine. I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm not very like into like pop culture or anything, so I don't even have that many celebrities like just on my mind by default. Um, Definitely, like, not a politician. <laughs> <laughs> Bill know. said, if I'm going to live with them, Lassie. <laughs> Alex said, I'd love to meet Ben Franklin. He's a very <laughs> interesting guy. Yeah. So true. Oh, you can go, like, back in time, too. Oh, of course. Harry said, Bob Ross. <laughs> Susie said, my mother. Oh, that's mm. sweet. Back and in he time. said, His Holiness, the Pope. Mm -hmm. mm. Maybe like, I don't know. Maybe some like Greek philosopher or something. Because they don't have like paintings of them. They only have like sculptures. Would it be cool to like live with like one of those like ancient Greek philosophers and like pick their brains about like the meaning of art and like representation <laughs> like while like making a painting of them or something. That could be fun. Uh -huh. So like Aristotle or Socrates or maybe Plato, yeah. You sure. kind of just pick at random or or what? There's this guy Diogenes who's like really funny. Um, mm. he <laughs> um, okay, so I think it was like Socrates, and he had like you know it's like own school, and Socrates was very like very really, like prestigious for it, and so one day like and Diogenes was like kind of like the opposite of that. He like was very anti like material, anti status, anti like thinking that like anyone's like better than anyone else. Um, he just wanted to like live and be left alone and kind of like make fun of everyone for thinking that like life had higher meaning really. <laughs> um, and so one day, this is like a short story to kind of like demonstrate his perspectives and practices. But um, <laughs> I think Socrates was running a class and uh, Diogenes walks in and Socrates is in the middle of like defining a human as like a featherless biped. Cause that's like the best they could do back then. Um, and then like, Diogenes is like, ha, loser. And then he comes back like a few minutes later with like a completely like plucked like chicken that's like screaming. And he's like, is this a human? Is this a human, <laughs> Socrates? And then like, you know, obviously like, um, like the whole class is kind of just like, um, we don't know what we're doing here anymore. Like um, this like random guy from the street just kind of disrupted this entire intellectual process, but he kind of has a point. So we don't really know what to do. So, mm. yeah, Diogenes was just like a big disruptor, and he was just very entertaining in my eyes for that. So uh -huh. I think it would be fun to like try to paint and like memorialize him, because like, you know, portraits are associated with like prestige and immortality and stuff, while he was like very like anti like anything like that. So I think that'd be like really funny. Um, Do you think he would just try to disrupt your portrait process? Yes, that would be very funny. <laughs> and you would enjoy that? I think so, because then I get to say that, like, I did it. <laughs> um, yeah, cool. Diogenes is fantastic. Good answer. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad I came up with that. <laughs> um. Um, I'm going to butcher this name, but I will try. So forgive me, everyone, in advance. Uh, Sarah Price said Malala Yousaf Yousafzai. Oh, I know her. Uh, I mean, I know of her. Sorry. She's been through so much, but has a luminous spirit. I would love to see 
if I could capture that. Mm -hmm. She's in... Sounds really interesting. Yeah, I'm not an expert, but she was a feminist rights activist, especially for our school mm. children and, like, education. Mm. Um, in, I'm pretty sure it was India, but in a Middle Eastern country where that kind of thinking and practice was severely and violently discouraged. So, mm. yeah, she definitely deserves a portrait. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, I don't really know what's going on over here, but we'll figure it out. <laughs> um. Robin Slee said, Cleopatra, but it would have to be with a D&D &D Dungeons and Dragons fantasy twist. A couple of raging Anubis in the mix. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that'd be quite the grand portrait, I must say. I see someone likes the Egyptian mythology aesthetic. Yeah. Very much approved. <clears throat> so what are you trying to figure out right now in your painting, May? I'm like I'm trying to match the transfer to like the reference because like the shapes are all like weird and curvy. So I'm looking for the, like this one like half moon shape that looks pretty uniform and distinct, but like I'm not seeing it, so I might just have to make it up. That's okay. Rely on your proportional drawing skills. Or my confidence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sometimes the confidence stroke can take care of errant marks. Mm -hmm. what is, there's, I think there's a saying about that, actually. Um, a brush with confidence. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's my video. I'm a true fan. Um, I, it's, it says some, something along, along the lines of, like, you could have, like, this perfectly technical painting um, will still fall short of a bold painting full of mistakes. And it's this idea that like, mm -hmm. when you paint with confidence and with boldness, it actually shows in your brush strokes in a way that if you're so focused on like the technical <laughs> aspect or maybe if you're doing the technical aspect out of fear, I would say maybe very hesitant about the marks that you're making, mm -hmm. it kind of reveals itself and it, it shows through the painting. Interesting. Um, yeah. I mean, that's not something that you want to try to embrace as you're learning, I would say, but once you get an understanding of the fundamentals and you know how to make a technical painting, keeping that in mind I think is very important because it really does um, make an impact. Wow, Didi said, um, Ben Franklin is my great uh, grandfather times 11 uncle. Whoa. Or great, great times 11 uncle. Sick. So whatever that is. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, that is amazing. I would choose Prince William and Princess Kate. Hmm. Maybe Kafka, like the author, because he was so like aggressively not celebrated during his lifetime for like his genius. Um, I think he deserves something. I was only pick one, May. I know. I said maybe <laughs> for a reason. It's okay. Oh, okay, okay. I think Diogenes would be a much more engaging experience. I think Kafka <laughs> would just, like, cry the whole time. <laughs> mm. Poor man. Uh, what am I doing? Christian Arnold said, Frank Frazetta would be great. He was an inspiration for so many. Eddie said, Layla Jana, whose nonprofit Sama Source lifted 50,000 people out of poverty by teaching them basic computer skills. She died at age 37 of a rare form of cancer. Hmm. Susie said, I would also like to paint Georgia O'Keeffe. <laughs> Judy said, I would like to get to know Titian 
and learn from him how he learned to paint, plus have him teach me how to paint him. <laughs> it's milk in the whole experience. Yeah. Very valid. Question from Mary Jo. Yeah. May, have you ever lost your transfer and just had to wing it? Yes, many times. Nice play on words there, Mary. Mary Jo, I appreciate that. Wing it. Uh huh. Gotta love it. <laughs> We're just waiting for the fourth episode <laughs> to ask that question. Uh, but yeah, that's happened uh, multiple times. And it's just like a lot of. I don't think I would be able to do a live stream doing that like properly. It's just a lot of me like looking back and forth. Um, like holding the reference like two centimeters away from like the painting. Mm. Um, yeah, it has happened. Especially like when I was first learning this technique and like the first stage is all about, you know, like making the painting appear solid and establishing all your values and overall colors for various subjects, but like, you know, still maintaining the transfer. And so um, definitely like getting the density right kind of took like a few paintings to get the hang of for that first pass. So, mm -hmm. like sometimes, like as you're doing the first pass, you'll like be seeing the transfer, and then like after it's down, you're like you still have like the mental impression that like that area is like a place where the transfer is like visible to you. And then after it dries, you look at it and you're like, "That's fake news," and then you kind of freak out. But um, it's okay. It's okay. And like honestly, if you don't give someone the reference, like on a one-to-one -one scale, like you're the only person who's gonna know that you didn't like follow it exactly, basically. If you're like worried about something like super specific or technical. Well, it's also interesting how if you have the reference there, mm -hmm. it can kind of lead you naturally to a tighter painting. Mm -hmm. And if you want to intentionally have a looser painting, Sometimes that it can actually be beneficial to intentionally put the reference away and, you know, connect the dots yourself. Mm -hmm. um, which is actually, when I was doing this, uh, this blue painting over here, I um, was very careful to, I, I did a, do a transfer, but very selectively did I choose what marks I wanted to make and intentionally left out other marks that would have been nice to have, but I knew ultimately I didn't really need um, so that I would be forced to think bigger, broad, and more loosely as I was painting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used to put in like every single like pixel texture mark that I saw in like a transfer because I was like terrified to not have all the information I needed. And then that kind of wound up handicapping me like a bunch of times because like I just would not be able to understand what I was looking at like a lot of the times because it's like the shapes were so specific and small and like dense that they were just unintelligibly like unintellig unintelligible um, to my own eyes, even though like I was the one making the marks. So mm -hmm. there is a balance in there. Yeah, Mary Jo said that she's doing that right now, having to, she lost her transfer and she's having to wing it. I guess we're all just winging it out here. <laughs> I'm never speaking again, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and Bill said, I'd like to paint Carly. And nice. <laughs> Iconic. Yeah. So for those of you who, don't, you who don't know, Carly is the oft-referenced uh, portrait in, I think she's in block, she's in block four. She's a reference portrait, so we all call her Carly. Um, but a lot of Evolve students are painting her towards the end of their foundation program. And Eddie said, by the way, Today is National Ice Cream Day. Mm. Lovely. Have you celebrated with your favorite color, uh, favorite flavor? Favorite color yet? of ice cream. Sorry. Yeah. Favorite flavor yet? No. I have not. I deeply apologize to everyone on this live stream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go get ice cream and then come back and watch me. <laughs> and then hopefully this will be better. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm passing on the ice cream today. Um. Okay, here's, let's see. Oh, uh, from Kelly, I joined in a few minutes late, so you may have already answered this, but did you go back and smooth things on in the body? It seems things are smoother than they were at the end of last time. So um, I think last time we had a little bit of an issue of the, the camera was picking up the, the visuals a little bit differently. 
and I've since adjusted some of the settings of the camera so that it shows more accurately uh, what May is painting. So I think that's what it is, but no, she has not worked on it um, mm -hmm. since then. Here's a future forward question from Robin. 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 Get back at it again. May. <laughs> Robin. <laughs> What are your thoughts on the future of AI and art? Do you think Whoa. that it will dilute the creativity? Will it lead to a generation of technical artists or a generation of new thinkers? Mm. Ooh. Um, I'm not an expert, I'll preface by saying that. Um, I think it definitely allows people who are not as invested in developing like their own technical, like, physical skills in, like, just rendering things out of, like, material or software, like, Procreate or Photoshop or whatever, to kind of, like, be visually creative, which is, like, super cool. So it definitely, like, opens up the market a lot more, which is, like, cool in my opinion, um, especially for, like, a very different genre of art um, from a group of people with very different, like, experience and training, obviously, or lack of training. So it's like very organic, I would say. Um, so overall, like not a bad thing. I wouldn't necessarily like cheer it on too much either because I don't know exactly what their process is and like how, I don't know, how well it like kind of corresponds to what I believe counts as like self-made high quality art or whatever. But um, it's definitely interesting and definitely around to stay. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, ah, so we'll see. Yeah, well, I would love to hear everyone's thoughts on this. Um, I have some thoughts of my own, not, uh, not expert opinions or anything, just ignorant opinions <laughs> on the matter. But I have thought about how you know, that technology is advancing and AI are, you know, they're self-learning and there's just so much. Um, I know people have helped AI kind of learn how to mimic emotions. Um, they've, one uh, group of people actually had, they built an AI that like studied Rembrandt paintings and like all the, the faces of Rembrandt paintings and then it created like an an, a, an average of those, and then it created its own Rembrandt original painting that like Rembrandt never painted, but it looked as if Rembrandt had painted it, even to the point of they had to 3D print it because it was calibrating for the, the paint density that Rembrandt would use. And it like looks, like I can probably find it online somewhere, but it, it really looks like a Rembrandt. It's just incredible. And so, you know, as we start merging those different features together, you know, I think that, like, I think, I don't know, my, so my ignorant opinion is that there's gonna be some kind of robot craze, like AI craze, once we can like mass produce these things. And I guess we already are moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I think after a while, we're going to start craving the human touch. Like the thing like, you know, so like an AI could create a flawless something. Mm -hmm. But a human being has the potential to make a mistake. And I think that has some value. And there's something very impressive about that. And um, I think... Yeah, there's something about that to me that's like, that just says a lot. And so it might polarize um, mm -hmm. people in some ways. Like maybe some people will be totally embracing and accepting of it. Maybe they'll get AI chips in their bodies or whatever. Um, and then I think other people will probably completely avoid that. So there might be some polarization there. But I think a lot of people will really crave like just the fact that humans have the ability to make mistakes and that we can accept each other for our mistakes and that might even equate to some monetary value to a degree in the art world. Um, so yeah, Bill said uh, part of the beauty is imperfection. So I, I think 
<clears throat> so I think that'll happen, like, not just in the world of painting, but in general. Um, you know, just the, like, we have a big desire for intimacy, for relationships, and, um, yeah. Let's see what the comments say here. Sarah Price said, I think of AI painting the same way I think of drum machines. It's always going to be missing the soul that makes the art special. Dee Dee said, my cousin worked in Hollywood, uh, yeah, my cousin worked in Hollywood as an artist for major motion, motion pictures in the 1970s and 80s. He had to learn computer graphics and drawings when most of Hollywood turned to digital art. Mm -hmm. Alex said, I think AI will definitely become a tool for artists, but probably won't replace them. The same dilemma happened when digital art first became accessible. Mm. Eddie said, AI isn't painting anything. The programmer is using a sophisticated computer program to make a painting. Yep, that's true. So you could even say that the programmer has learned how to multiply <laughs> art creation in and of itself, which of course is also impressive. Okay, take care, Eddie. Have a good night. Good night, Eddie. I'm catching up on other comments here. Um, oh, Melanie was responding to the earlier question about whose portrait would you paint. Uh, she said, my paternal grandmother. Never met her. Just met my biological father a couple of years ago. And she never knew about me. Hmm. But if I were to choose an artist, then Artemisia Gentileschi. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Mary Jo has asked, I'm having trouble with paint being sucked into the gesso board. Is there a good way to prepare the surface? Um, I don't um, know that that's the best question to ask on this live stream, Mary Jo. Um, I'd recommend that you reach out to our homework instructors for help with that. Um, but yeah, I would say, because there's kind of a, there'd be a whole discussion and like almost like a video on how to properly prepare a board. Um, and a, as a quick, easy answer, it might have to do with sanding down the gesso a little bit or making sure that there's enough coats of gesso on it. Um, but if those aren't solving your problem, then I'd recommend that you reach out to the homework instructors. Gary said, I love the way May is holding that brush so softly. Thanks. <laughs> I'll keep doing it. <laughs> Bill said, you can't replace a Stradivarius. Mm. So true. I used to play violin, and then I quit it so I could paint more. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, though. But look at where I am now. It's pretty cool, too. Christian said, I think AI work is a bit like buying mass production furniture from Ikea, while a painting from a human is a unique work from a skilled carpenter. Ikea has very good products, but it's lacking the soul. Dee Dee said, it's no different than now people stop using the microwave and going back to the oven or crock pot cooking or leaving the city to go live on a farm. That's true. There's always like, there's like this very simple like philosophical concept called like the I think it's like the Hegelian um, dialectic, just not named after this guy called Hegel, who is German. It doesn't matter anyway. But um, basically, he just um, he kind of emphasizes that there's always like a pattern in history where 
it's like in sets of threes. So it'll be like one big trend or one like initiative that kind of like gets a lot of traction and becomes the mainstream. And then like as that becomes the mainstream, there's always like a counter movement against it that's just like derived out of like for the sole purpose of like opposing it. Um, and then like eventually there's like a resolution. So it's like thesis, antithesis, and then like synthesis where they both kind of compromise. And then like that compromise becomes like the status quo. And it just happens like over and over and everything. Hmm. Definitely applicable in this conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Judy, for um, appreciating what I said. Alex said, there already exists filters and programs that can take a photograph and make it look like a painted image, yet people still pay for hand-painted portraits. Yep. Dee Dee said, I love the blue of the wings, and Robin said, she has a feather touch. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I try. Um... Linda said there's a, excuse me, there's an interest in skills and handmade, like the popularity of the lost trades fairs, so that generations pass on the techniques, yeah? Yeah, I think as humans we all recognize, like, the value of time and having something that is able to last for a long time and kind of live beyond us, and then also just, like, the value of labor and intent and energy from another person. Oh. So I don't think human-made things will ever really become obsolete, you know, unless like our value system just completely erodes and changes in the next, I don't know, millennia or something. <laughs> mm -hmm. Carrie said, I need to work on my feather touch, lol. Mine is more like a hammer at times. Bill said, a feather touch is good on a wing. I agree. And Robert said, was drawing and painting the original anachronistic computer screen and video game? Hmm. What? I don't know about video game. Video game, I feel like maybe it would be more of like, a, you know, Games before videos would be more of a original. I have no opinion because I don't really know. What yeah, the I can't really weigh in on that. <laughs> I am going to try to adjust this lighting a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Let's take some more drastic measures. So. I'm gonna is jump it just off the all chat. glare up there? <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of glare, um, which is kind of interesting because we can all see the, the texture of the paint. <laughs> so I'm actually going to zoom in on it okay. before we change it, and then I'll try changing some things. So bear with me, everybody. Thanks. Mind just stepping a little bit over. This way? Okay. Yeah, that's fine.
That was it. <laughs> that glare is still showing up. I am pretty amazed. I think maybe it's because before this was always like resting against the top, so it was casting like a little shadow. Maybe we're just used to how that looks. Mm. I'm not sure. I'm gonna keep trying some new things. Okay. point I'm kind of just drawing in parts of my transfer with like this very neutral gray um, and it'll just play nicely with whatever actually needs to go there um, since it's pretty middle of the road value and not very saturated so that's where we are Well, nothing is really working, May, um, unless I seriously changed huh. some of our camera setups. Okay. What I, the final thing I want to ask is maybe mm. if you could fan brush down some oh, yeah. of the sections you currently have. Sure. Um, so that we can see a little bit more of what you're painting. So kind of, as you paint, kind of fan brush as you go maybe, like okay. in section by section. I'll just do this bit for now. Yeah. Oh yeah, that, there how's, it goes. How's that everyone? Much better. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Uh -huh. That was really satisfying. <laughs> Okay, back in the chat. What did I miss? Um, Carrie, yes, May is using some transfer lines. I think she can just barely make them out mm -hmm. at this point. I'm covering them as I go too, so. And Robert is asking, is that impasto paint in the wings? Um, maybe a little bit. Um, not intentionally yet. Um, I really like to add it towards the end 
Um, usually I try not to on illustrations because illustrations tend to have like a lot of information that needs to be like printed at like a much smaller scale to be on like book covers or magazines or whatnot. Um, but for like larger scale kind of portraits or figure paintings like this, it's like it's acceptable, but only if it's like something you intend. If you like can't control the texture or density of your paint and it just happens and it's like kind of suboptimal. Um, but no, not yet. I think not intentionally. It might be a little bit up in here, but I can fan brush that out so it's not a big deal. Or I could leave it if I decide I like it. Um, yeah. And Robert is asking, what music do people like when they paint? Yeah, so we actually, mm -hmm. we usually have music going at this art school all the time. But mm -hmm. for the live streams, we have to turn the music off so that we don't run into copyright, um, so that people can hear us clearly. And, um, and also, people who are watching can choose to listen to their own music in the background while we're doing this live stream. Um, but if people want to just share what music they like, feel free to... Jump into the comments. I kind of listen to anything. Um, usually if it's late and I'm like painting um, like alone or I'm like getting kind of tired, I'll play like really loud, obnoxious, like low quality rap music to keep me going. Because <laughs> um, it's just kind of high energy sound. Um, but sometimes I'll listen to classical until I feel sleepy because usually that's what happens. Um, Yeah, just generally like whatever I listen to normally, I just listen to when I paint. So never paint in silence. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it happens. Like I'll turn off my music to talk to someone and then I forget to turn it back on and then like like all of a sudden I like realize it again and I get very uncomfortable. <laughs> when I'm struggling to get in the mood for painting, um when I was 15 and started learning under Kevin, he was always playing Andrea Bocelli. And so I just, I'll turn that on and it gets me right back in the mood to paint. <laughs> Kevin psychologically like conditioned you. <laughs> into, like, well, just the music. romanticism as well, you know? Right. Kind of just brings you to those, those places. Nice. Robin said, I need to head off to bed shortly. Looks like maybe this session and one more. Actually, there will be a few more. A few more. To finish off this painting. I'm not um, that good, sorry. <laughs> and then she's wondering if someone new will jump into the live stream. Maybe more May. Maybe you, Daniel. Maybe you, Daniel. Ooh. Maybe. No <laughs> promises. <laughs> good night, Robin. It would be really nice if I could finish this in like one more sitting, but I'm not going to shoot for that because it's probably not going to happen. Mm. <clears throat> yes, Darkstar said, I think May is taking over the live streams for summer. Yes, she is. I am. Evan is very happy to be on vacation with you. <laughs> And she said, Andrea is amazing. Yeah. And Didi said, depending on the angle of the, the camera angle, the paint looks blue, purple, or mahogany brown. Maybe it is the change of lighting. Yep, that's a factor. Um, we also do have the cameras. They're, well, they're pretty much the same, but there are some very subtle adjustments. One is a little bit more calibrated to getting a nice um, shot of May as like a headshot, and then this other one is calibrated to matching the painting as closely as possible. Um, but yes, definitely the angle, because then, because that's really how, I mean, that's how, that's how we see where light is bouncing off of things and entering into our eyes. So when mm -hmm. I switch the camera here, we're seeing more light refracting off of that surface, or bouncing off of that surface and entering into the camera which gives us some cooler tones.
question from Mary Jo. Mm -hmm. All that's happening right now would be considered direct painting? Yeah, I would say so. Not super strictly though, but um, I mean, I'm definitely gonna have to rework parts of this later, but I am not intending on making like significant changes or anything like that, so. Good night, Robin. <laughs> Yeah, and direct painting is something that we teach in block four of the Evolve program. And of course, for anyone interested in what Evolve is all about, then you can check out the links in the description of this live stream here. May has gotten all these skills from Kevin Murphy, who has founded this brick and mortar school that we are streaming from. Um, but we're hosting this on our Evolve Artist channel, which is the online version of this brick and mortar art school. Um, and so Evolve is, I think we're in like over 50 countries. 53. 53? I, I think, I think. Awesome. Yeah, so we're all over helping people create art without limitations. It's kind of cool. I like it. Just kind of. <laughs> <laughs> so are you still in your shadows? At this point, or are you starting to transition into some lights? Um, I have like the value range for like these darker parts of the feathers that are like overlapping the figure, so I'm just doing that now. Um, but I still have like a bunch of the shadows up here to do. But what I'm doing is kind of like bouncing between these two sections um, because, like, I feel like if I fixate on one for too long, like, the shapes and lines start, like, swimming at me from the reference, and so I can't really keep track of what I'm doing. So I'm trying to bounce between them. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like working on two different paintings, so you can keep fresh eyes for both of them. But just different sections. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And yes, Sarah, 1,200 and climbing. 1,200. That's the uh, number of students in the Evolve program. Oh, cool. OK. Uh, question from DD. Mm -hmm. May, do you have any special preparations before painting? Do you do a meditation or spiritual ritual or a special food or drink? <laughs> no. Um, sometimes Kevin will make me iced coffee, and that's kind of it. Uh, um, <laughs> I, I can't meditate, I think, too much. I've tried many times, and I just end up very frustrated at myself for like not being able to calm down. And so it's very counterproductive to me. Um, no, no rituals. I just come in like with the intention to complete something to a certain degree, and I do it. Um, yeah, there's no, there's no secret hack. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know, at least four hours, four hours of sleep is good too, but <laughs> that's just like in general, so yeah, there's no, there's no real like trick to it. Just kind of decide you're going to paint this precise thing in this precise way. Mm -hmm. And if you can't deliver, either you keep making the decision to keep working until you can deliver or you stop. And that's your choice too, but you have to own it. So, I don't know, it's very like straightforward to me. No rituals, just driving there and setting up and trying to drink water throughout. <laughs> mm. That's awesome, Mason. Uh, Mason said, I'm so excited to get to this point in the program, close mm -hmm. to finishing block one. So eventually, fantastic job, May. Thank you. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, the other person. Yes, congratulations. <laughs> sorry. Um, What's that? Were you talking to me or the other person, the evolved person? Because um, you said May, and I don't know, I tend to oh, hear my oh. name very easily. No, no, Mason was saying, things. fantastic job, May. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, you're good, you're good. You're painting right now. I am painting. No worries. Uh, Darkstar said, it's hard for me to see on my tiny phone, but does the more 
transparent part of the wing have a feathery texture? Um, not yet. It's not really filled in yet. Yeah, not, not, not particularly. It's very oil painty texture at the moment. Mm. Robert said, meditation is not about calming down. It's about being calm, about not being calm. Well, the point is I can't do it, <laughs> so <laughs> I guess that would explain why. Or at least, like, I haven't committed to figuring it out, because I don't think I... It's not, like, necessary for me to, like, function properly, so... But to each their own, obviously. Yep, it's certainly working out for you, May. <laughs> Sometimes, like, I find that when I get, like, really neurotic about part of a painting as I'm doing it, it, like, comes out, like, really well, so. But then other times, if I'm, like, calm and just, like, steadfast with it, then it also comes out well. There's no real, like, rule, at least for me. Um, other than just stay committed to the result. Can I get a time check, please? It is 8.30. Oh, that's not bad. Not too shabby. That's not bad at all. Question. Sorry, I should probably go back here. Sorry, you were oh, saying? You're good. Qu uh, question from Christian. Mm -hmm. Did someone at the art school or Evolve ever paint a portrait of Kevin? Yes. I have. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I think that's pretty... I think you have too, haven't you, Daniel? I have not. Huh. He's done a portrait of himself for like a demo. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't seen any other paintings of him by other people yet, question mark. <laughs> I did make a stick figure caricature of Kevin. You did. I'm very proud of that. It's very iconic. <laughs> I enjoy it immensely. We should have like a Kevin fan art competition among like of all students. That would be really funny. <laughs> but yeah, a few people have painted Kevin's portrait since he also um, takes a lot of the reference images, both for Evolve and for the art school here. He's a, a pretty accessible model, mm -hmm. you could say. Kevin's in a bunch of my uh, science fiction illustrations, too. He's all dressed up in armor and yelling at unseen things, so it's also enjoyable. I'm going to make an adjustment to this camera here. And if you wouldn't mind just stepping a little bit, yeah, that's, that's fine. What you did before, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Left foot, two stomps. Uh, Channery Blue said, I have painted Kevin's fists and they are sitting in front of my desk, LOL. That sounds terrifying. <laughs> that's a place to work. Um, I'm kidding. Yeah, I painted that too. It was funny. Like back when I, um, when like quarantine first started in like 2019 and everything, I like, I didn't have like photo shoots in advance or anything, so I didn't really have anything to work on. So I just took a bunch of like evolved images home. Um, 
I just worked on those for like the first three months where we literally could not go outside. Um, so yeah, the fist was one of them. I did the Buddha too, I think. And um, the scribe, like the metal guy with like the grapes and like the, the cup with like a lot of texture on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are images in the Evolve program, block four, mm -hmm. May's referring to. Which, actually, if you're interested in seeing those images, if you go to, I'll just drop in a link here, evolveartist.com. See if that, I'm not sure if that turned into a link. Let me try again. Um, and if you go to, I want to say it's curriculum. Let's try that, see if that works. And that should take you to the different images in block four. I uh, just read a, a cool comment here from Sarah Price. I've noticed in the paintings May has shown us that... <laughs> what? I'm kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with people observing your work, May. This is a good thing. People are taking your work seriously. Oh, boy. Take, your, take yourself seriously, too, you know. I, it's kind of scary sometimes. <laughs> no, I know you yeah. do. Continue. You're yeah. just joking around. Um, okay. All right, so I've noticed in the painting. <laughs> what? Okay, nothing. This is why I continue. Okay. All right, take three. I've noticed in the paintings May has shown us that there seems to be a recurring theme where the situation is dangerous, <laughs> but the subjects so are empowered true. and can so overcome true. the danger. So it's dangerous, but also very positive. But they're winning, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is that intentional at all, or just the kind of scenes you like to paint? Um, the danger part is intentional, the winning part isn't. <laughs> yeah, I like, I like high, high intensity scenery. Um, just more visually interesting, you know? It's like, what's gonna happen? Are they gonna be okay? So I'm like, oh, look, a field, you know? Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> That's definitely an oversimplification, obviously, but uh, yeah. I don't, I don't think much about the empowering part. I'm just like, oh, do they look cool? Like, do they look angry and like ready to fight and ready to run, you know? I don't really think about the empowerment part, but now that you said it, I will talk about that more because it sounds better, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for noticing stuff in my work that I don't even notice. That's fun. Um, Ooh. Ooh. We've got some fan debate going on over here. <laughs> what are people saying? Alex said to Sarah Price, maybe whether they overcome the danger is up to interpretation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Should I make a poll just for kicks? Yes. <laughs> okay. Are they going to be okay? Triple question mark. <laughs> <laughs> How do I word this, this question here? Um, Does May ever have intent, or is she just screwing around? No. <laughs> now I'm interested. How do how do other people perceive my art? Because I just see it as like this technical product of like subjects that I like. <laughs> How about, do you think May's subjects will overcome the danger she puts them in? <laughs> kind of makes you the queen. I like it. <laughs> I sound like God. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Okay. I'm very excited to uh, get the responses this, here. This is so funny. <laughs> <laughs> There's no right or wrong answer here, unless maybe there is. Maybe there is. I don't know. Shoot your shot. Sarah Price, entering into the debate, said, very true, but the possibility is built in. Mm -hmm. Maybe the point is building in the narrative possibility, you know, narrative, mm -hmm. raw narrative potential. 
keep you up at night, you know? Are they gonna make you up? <laughs> Sarah's really taking a stand here. <laughs> she said, yes, they will. And they will inspire the people they are rescuing who we can't see in the painting. So Love it. So true. <laughs> maybe, I, maybe that's the next painting, there's a giant rescue scene. Like, all the models are just like different versions of me. That would be really funny. <laughs> <laughs> Save me for myself. It's like that Evanescence song. <laughs> right, I'll, I'll stop screwing around. <laughs> and friend, friendly reminder to watch where you're standing to help us out with that camera. Mm. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, you Gant Magar to answer your question with which method is this painting called? This is direct painting. Yeah. that May is employing, and we teach that in block four of the Evolve program and the Foundation program. Um, <laughs> we know. What? How's it going? <laughs> well, um, first, Mary Jo said, I so appreciate the honesty in conversation in both Kevin's and May's videos. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> and then Carrie said, but what happens if they trip over and sprain an ankle? Plot twist. <laughs> oh, no. I feel like that's... That's like the most mundane plot twist ever, spraining an ankle, like... Very anticlimactic. Yeah, but also like very realistic. And devastating. Quite devastating. That would really, you know, swing, swing you from one way to the other of yeah. whether or not they will make it out alive. Yeah, you know, fate hangs in the balance of a sprained ankle or a lack thereof. Life is crazy. Uh, Channery said, I always like to think that an artist's choice in subject matter is reflective of what they truly feel subconsciously. Ooh. Psychoanalyze me now. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, that's so funny. I don't know, I don't know that that would be fully appropriate for people to start trying please to type your personality. Please, or, please don't psychoanalyze yeah, me. Yeah, that would be a little too Not much to my me. face, at least. Yeah, just do it. <coughs> Uh, Think about it at work on yourselves. company time, okay? <laughs> not, not to my face. Uh. Uh, Alex said, even if there isn't a deliberate narrative within the paintings, I think the intensity, dynamics, etc. of the scene naturally prompt the viewer to imagine a story. So yeah. true. That is the point. I just want narrative potential. I just want you to wonder and hope and be odd. I don't, I don't need like a conclusion, like an explicit storyline. All right, I'm going to end the poll. <laughs> what are the results? How is it looking? <laughs> uh, if you were going to guess, May. I feel like everyone thinks that they're going to make it. Mm. Or like most people. You have guessed correctly. That's so sweet of you guys. So 90% wow. or 91% said yes and only 9% said no. What a positive community we have here, guys. There is no real answer. Oh, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I think Alex is spot on with that mm -hmm. interpretation. And I think it's cool how story can really do that, right? Like. You can communicate very powerful ideas through story because it becomes alive for so many people in ways that they can relate to. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you kind of just say something like, the people are fighting in their <laughs> last stand and they don't know if they're going to make it, it's kind of like, okay, okay, right. But Thanks if you see it, if you feel yeah. it, you experience it, mm -hmm. it kind of ignites your memories and other stories and mm -hmm. um, you start to connect with it and you see the past and the future all at once. Mm -hmm. I think like keeping a narrative vague is like the best way to make it memorable because then it's like more easily connected to something the viewer is like familiar with. Um, mm -hmm. If you're not like just outlining it for them so they can't like really eliminate things as easily mm -hmm. to like remember it with. Yeah, Alex made a great point. He said, just like how a book cover shouldn't spoil the plot. And that is very true, especially if you're going to be, you know, an illustrative mm -hmm. artist making these book covers. You can't, you can't give it away, right? Mm -hmm. You can't say that it's actually going to happen. You need to show how dire the circumstances are 
to pull people in. Yeah. But there is a narrative developing, May. A new one. What? What is going on? It's about the ankle sprain. People are just like, I love that there, there's like head cannons about my illustrations now. That's crazy. <laughs> tell me, tell me the lore of the ankle spray that I didn't even come up with okay, for my well, own paintings. So. All right, so <laughs> with the dangers around or like dragons and stuff, I yeah. think the adrenaline would be high or it would be in high gear. You wouldn't even feel the sprain. So the sprain happens, right? Right. But you don't feel it. Mm -hmm. You keep fighting. Mm -hmm. And maybe the other team members don't realize it also. Mm -hmm. And so we might, you know, find ourselves in one of those very sad scenes where a There's heroic like act happens, and, yeah. but the sprained oh. ankle is just too much to bear and turns out to be a fatal mortality. You guys are thinking like on the scene, just a sprained ankle and then bam. <laughs> I was thinking like, oh, over time, they like make it out of the situation and then they get like, it gets like infected or like they keep having to put weight on it and it doesn't heal properly. And then they, I don't know. Wow, you guys just cut to the chase right there. That's <laughs> that's pretty good. I'm impressed. Now, this is from Darkstar. If a limb is snapped, <laughs> doom for sure. <laughs> we need some like doctors in the chat to tell us what the most like tragic like injury is or something. Mm. Like what would have the most narrative potential? <clears throat> Should have just called the painting like sprained ankle or something, honestly. <laughs> sprained ankle. <laughs> uh, Darkstar said, the power of covers is awesome, yes. And then Alex said, I think with the guns and rupturing lava, a sprained ankle might be the least of one's concerns. This is true. I did sprain my ankle a few months ago, and I was able to play a whole game of soccer on it because the adrenaline was so high. But the next day, it uh, was almost fatal, one might say. <laughs> Daniel was, Daniel can confirm all of these stories because he was there, okay? Right. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I was there. He was the one spraining his ankle. Yeah, he fighting the lava. It was, it was a tough battle, but we did pull through thanks to the 90% of people <laughs> who were voting for and rooting for our victory. Sarah also agrees the adrenaline me. of the situation oh. could overcome a twisted ankle. I sprained my ankle too. I didn't sprain. I think I twisted it like really hard. I went like, we're just telling stories about injuries now. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> I was at college and um, like a friend of mine, a friend, I don't know, whatever, an acquaintance invited me to go on skateboarding with him. And I was like, sure. And then I was like in a pair of Doc Martens, which is like a pair of boots that are like not very comfortable, but they look like really good. <laughs> so, and like they, they get like really comfortable after you like break them in, which means like you have to wear them for like three to six months or something. Um, but I wasn't wearing them that often because they were uncomfortable. So it's just like this loop of discomfort, but like wanting to look good in boots, right? Um, and so I was wearing these boots and like going skateboarding for like the second time in my life. And we're in like this really big parking lot with like this very mild like downward slope. And so, like, at first I'm going, like, across it, so I'm not going down the slope, obviously, because, you know, that's, like, very silly behavior. Um, but then, like, I was, like, pretty good from the beginning, and so I kind of got, like, overconfident, and then I was like, oh, I'm just going to go like, down the hill. And then I went down the hill, and then I, like, I literally, I, like, twisted. I, I think I was going too forward, too fast forward, and I kind of, like, fell, like, fo like sideways, but, like, down the hill forward. Mm. And then, like, I rolled my ankle, like, really hard. Um, like going in that direction and I literally like did a flip and like landed in like that like you can't see what I'm doing but like, <laughs> like the Black Widow pose in like that movie that like um Elena like makes fun of like with the hand down and like the other one like up and everything I literally landed like that and I was like wow it looks so cool and then like the pain just like hit and I was like yeah. mm. <laughs> never mind that's okay so yeah was that the inspiration for your betrayal painting yes. and that's why you I called was, it betrayal I was betrayed by my friend who ah. like let me go down the, that's 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 it Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the print is now for sale. Yeah. For $100, you can look at this image in your house whenever you want and think about my skateboarding tragedy at Rutgers University. <laughs> yeah, and for those of you who are in here, I will show again the, uh, not this one, the painting that we're referring to here.
I'll just drop in the link again. So if you click on that link I just shared, you can go ahead and order a print from May of this painting in super high quality print. I think you're, yeah, it was like you have a matte paper, 90% mm -hmm. of the actual size. Super awesome, awesome painting. Oh, we do have some doctors weighing in on the, the subject though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How's it going? Yeah, so, um, well, for one, oh, um, so Alex funny. Tan, who I'm sure has a... He's definitely a doctor. Yeah, yeah definitely. I know him personally. He's definitely a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not actually. But he says, um, going back to uh, what it would be that would, the injury, I'm trying to remind you here, the, uh, the injury that would be the most devastating? Yeah. He said stubbed toe for sure. Source, <laughs> sources. Trust me, bro. Uh, that would just like, I mean, like morale, morality. Yeah, morality would like definitely drop off a cliff if someone had a stubbed toe. So, and then, you know, all goes downhill from there. Sarah Price said, "If you lost the war because you sprained your ankle, that would definitely not be the war story you told I your lost friends when the you got game. home." <laughs> Why <laughs> would it have cost a sprained ankle? <laughs> That's pretty funny. Uh, Christian said we should ask Achilles about this. Mm. Talk. Yeah, That's a good reference. We love her. Greek mythology. And yes, Carrie, uh, she said, I was wondering what the single wing signifies. Which I think we've discussed this on every Literally single every stream. so far. I love that this image good. is intriguing people, though. That's good. Yeah, it's good. It's cool that it's, people are searching for meaning yeah, from keep, it. Yeah, keep searching for meaning. The, the, one, ring rep, the one wing represents um, like a single sprained ankle. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> at this point, um, I, here's a short version. I like painting wings because I find them aesthetic and fantastical and cool looking. And I also like asymmetry because... Um, spite. <laughs> no, I just, th I like asymmetry because it usually creates more interesting compositions. And so if you combine those two concepts, um, you get this kind of image. And a regular human and just a flat out angel are not as interesting to me as like someone who is kind of both. So it can be viewed as like a metamorphosis or like a state of change or something like that so it just has more narrative potential with one wing rather than like a standard image of either both wings or none i think that's all i have to say <laughs> mm -hmm. so similar to your other narrative pieces this is sort of posing the question yet again yes is this is this like a a handicap of sorts losing a wing or was one wing just has to just been uh, like grown, grown in, yeah. Maybe I, I can know. make another poll about that. What do you think? <laughs> Find out on the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I've been told that like my capture piece, like that painting with the angel in the two hands, it looks. It does, he doesn't look like he's like some people have thought of it as like he's being like he's finally like returning home like he's being like rescued and then other people say it looks like he's trying to escape so that's also up to interpretation i know like in my head when i was designing it i was making it go for like he was trying to escape and he wasn't like happy about the hands kind of encircling him um i like that there can be multiple interpretations of a single image Carrie brought up an interesting point. Mm. With the, the current state of things for this figure of ours, it would be like rowing with one oar. You would go around in circles. Mm. So yes, so this figure needs to grow another wing or, or um, enjoy, maybe enjoy 
the fact that it has one wing and no one else does. Adapt and overcome. <laughs> That's the title of the piece. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, I have a, such a hard time coming up with titles because like everything is super ambiguous and then so part of me wants to like try to find a narrative and then another part of me wants to just focus on like the imagery and there are like so many different narratives and then like also different parts of the imagery that you could focus on like the interactions between the subjects like the overall color scheme or like the environment or whatever and then I usually just end up choosing something really it's either like over the top or it's just like oversimplified in my opinion but um mm -hmm. yeah friendly reminder to stay step to one side as you're painting thank you mm -hmm. And if it helps, you could also slide the the painting over to your right a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be okay. I'll just try to have like one foot off the mat at all times. Okay. That should be good. Thank you. We mm -hmm. all appreciate it. <laughs> it's definitely not natural, I know. No, it's all good. <clears throat> Bill said he's circling for a landing, and Sarah said he's been hurt in the situation where the smoke is coming from, and this is his redemption. I love how confident Sarah is with all of her interpretations. Redemption. I like that idea. Yeah. He's healing. <laughs> he's waiting for the next battle where the smoke is coming from. <clears throat> Dark Star said... Yeah. That you're taking a glass half full or glass half empty to another level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice way to put it. Maybe for like titling this piece, I should just come up with three titles and then like you guys just vote. Yeah, we could do a poll for it if That'd you're willing. Pretty. That'd be fun. Just make sure that you really like all three. <laughs> 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 but they say that once you, um, like if you create two options and then flip a coin mm. the moment that you flip a coin is when you know which, which one you one want you it to want. be yeah. but it's not until you flip that coin that makes sense so i don't know that's that's kind of a big responsibility to give over but i'm sure we'd we would love to to vote for that if you're willing sarah price is like drafting like a novel about like what this means <laughs> <laughs> Chandri said, I can't imagine painting on camera. My work is so chaotic and messy. I think it would be impossible to Do you see it. this? <laughs> uh, it's pretty chaotic over here, too. Oh, I should probably fan brush for you guys. Well, there's a method to it, though. Is there? <laughs> okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's a You're working from value to value, shade to shade. A better. Yes, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you for reminding us. Alex said, I was told that if you flipped a coin and you regretted the result you got, then you should choose the other one. Yeah. Solid advice. <laughs> Sarah, Sarah Price said, LOL, you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so afraid. I'm gonna get, She's like, your an, number one fan. <laughs> I'm going to get like an email and it's just going to be like this Google Doc with like 70 pages worth of lore. <laughs> like each of my paintings. That would be so cool, actually. Um... This is, is not a request. <laughs> like, please don't, don't take that too seriously. Uh. Uh, Mason asks, so what is direct painting? Does it skip certain steps? So I believe you said that you're just finishing block one right now. So in the process we teach in block one, you first break down all of your shadows. Um, you paint in, you, you, you assign your values using four values and everything. And then you um, you paint your darkest shadow, and then your your second shadow, and uh, move on to your lights. For this one, this one kind of focuses on more like sections at a time, where you are you're utilizing everything that you've learned, like the same the same methodology, the same thought process about how shadows are darker than your lights and everything, but the way that you are are applying it is a little more straightforward, actually where um, 
you're kind of just taking a section by section and rendering it to the absolute best of your ability in a very more detailed focus. So that's why, um, you know, we've already had three sessions and May has been painting the figure and she's completely left the wing untouched. But if she was going to be painting this in like in a block one process, then she would have painted in all of her shadows um, either together or like in one sitting and, you know, built up the entire painting through that process. But the direct painting allows her to um, rely on everything that she's learned and her, her whole methodology, but focus all of her attention on one section at a time and to paint it to the absolute best of her ability. The thing is, though, is that if we handed this technique over to our beginning students, it wouldn't quite come out um, in the same way because you still need to be able to understand what you're looking at, visually break it down, process it, and um, rebuild it as you're doing all of these things. But it's kind of happening, happening more behind us in the background for May a little bit compared to what you'd be doing in block, block one and two and three even. I hope that answers your question, Mason. Uh, Sarah's, Sarah's real quick with this stuff. So Alex said, what's your take on why the wing is translucent? And Sarah Price said, it's still in the process of regrowing after its injury. True. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think Sarah knows better than you do, May. Sarah definitely knows better than I do. <laughs> you got bragging rights for me saying that. <laughs> Anytime anyone challenges you in an argument, just say, hey, I know better than May, right? It doesn't matter what the argument is. <laughs> is there just like a lore banter going on? <laughs> <clears throat> Rhythmic has asked, is instantaneous painting underrated? Um, I've does, never seen that term, instantaneous that painting before. Um, if you're referring it to being the same as direct painting, um, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's underrated. It's very helpful for um, like more detailed work and uh, if you want to kind of push a whole section very close to completion if not to complete completion um, so it has a very it's very functional very has a very good purpose um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best in all situations mm -hmm. yeah it's not one size fits all Definitely, for like any painting technique. Oh, now here's a plot twist from Channery Blue. Maybe. Maybe. The wing is the ghost fragment of the chicken wing the guy <laughs> ate for lunch. And I would add, this is the same chicken that Diogenes brought <laughs> to the class. <laughs> I'm just calling this featherless biped. It's like, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> We're just like making inside jokes at this point, just for this audience. <laughs> Alex said, incredible. <laughs> Aw, Sarah Price said, my creative spirit has been smushed all day at work. Aww. Watching your beautiful work is allowing it to come out. Smiley face. Wow, I love that. I'm glad. That's sweet. Stuff like that just makes your day, you know? That makes me quite happy, yeah. <laughs> and if you don't mind, uh, step your thank you. <laughs> I feel like I'm, what's it called? The Cupid Shuffle, where it's like... <laughs> <laughs> Robert said, he lost a wing and doesn't even want the other one anymore. He'll just remove that also and fly on land instead of the sky. Mm. Flying circles around the land. I don't know. Maybe you accept change or maybe you seek redemption. Cope. Or maybe in, in the case of Robert's caption there, I'm kind of thinking about it. It's like fly on land, right? That you could interpret that more poetically as like flying in, in another kind of way other than actually flying, right? Yeah. It's like, 
like you said, like, a, yeah, another avenue of redemption. So I think that that actually kind of happens in life sometimes, not to get randomly deep here, <laughs> <laughs> but to get randomly deep here. Um, you know, we can have a, an instance in our life where, like, we experience, like, a, you know, a devastating moment, and we maybe we expect redemption is going to come out a very specific way, or we're going to try to redeem ourselves out of the situation or something. But along that journey, we find redemption in a completely different way than we originally expected. Is this making sense? It's like Zuko and Avatar, right? Yeah. Oh, that's actually really good. Yeah, because he was all like, oh, do I spoil it? Oh, yeah, go for it. Should Tell I us spoil about it. I feel like everyone's watching it at some point, or at least everyone should have. Um, yeah, spoiler alert, everyone turn off the sound. And <laughs> everyone you... leave, I'm about to talk about Avatar. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't leave, don't leave us. <laughs> um, but basically Zuko, he starts off as like the, the main antagonist that we like interact with at least. Um, the real antagonist is like his dad who like is um, the ruler of like the Fire Nation and the Fire Nation is just like bullying like the rest of the world. Um, and then Wait, I have to paint this part. Give me a second. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, and then I was saying, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. So, and then Zuko starts off as the main antagonist, and he's been, like, sentenced by his father to capture the Avatar because um, the Avatar is, like, the only person or only, like, force in general that they think is can, like, uh, genuinely challenge the Fire Nation's, like, death grip on the world. And then, um, and so... Like, Zuko received the sentence as, like, a punishment for, like, talking to his father, like, out of turn because he was, like, at, like, this military meeting with his dad when he was, like, 13, and they were all, like, talking about, um, like, battle plans or whatever, and then they were going to, like, sacrifice this whole, like, platoon of, like, freshly, like, drafted soldiers of, like, you know, like, teenagers um, as, like, a diversion so that, like, the real troops could, like, come in and, like, do the real damage. But Zuko was, like, we shouldn't, like, sacrifice like a bunch of like young lives like just for the sake of it and then his dad was like haha you're weak and not fit for the throne um because you think that lives are valuable um and then so then his father challenged him to like like a full-on like duel and everything and so in order to like restore his honor and like be able to get back to like living as um the fire lord's son like Zuko has to find the avatar and like capture him and like kill him basically um and so like Zuko thinks that his means of redemption is going to come through like capturing the avatar and overcoming the avatar and then he can have his like father's affection and like approval again and he'll be like super happy with it and then he realizes that actually um like it wasn't his father's like and, and so like like fast forward and he like um his father, a bunch of things happen, and his father is led to believe that, like, Zuko captured the Avatar. And so, you know, we expect him to, like, we expect both of them to be, like, finally happy again, right? Um, like, with each other, but Zuko is just, like, very miserable because his father still, like, looks down on him. Um, and then, like, Zuko realizes that, like, the key to his happiness is not his father's approval, um, but it's, like, actually following his own destiny and, you know, doing what he thinks is right instead of just doing whatever is... Um, he thinks will make his father happy because that failed for like three years straight. And yeah, so he redeems himself by like, big spoiler, by uh, like switching sides and helping the Avatar fight his father. And yeah, it's great. It's a great show. If you're here and you haven't watched it and you listen to me say all that, you should still watch it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and also like, I think you could like, you could say he was trying to redeem himself by channeling his anger into mm. uh, power. Yeah. And like, you know, restoring things when he found, um, wow. Well, <laughs> we're just embracing we're the power things. of friendship. Yes. <laughs> um, friendship and education. Being accepted. Yeah. Um, he found a different kind of redemption there. Mm-hmm. He ends up being Aang's like, firebending teacher and it's like you know they were like really worried about who was going to be his firebending teacher because obviously everyone in the fire nation is like evil right um and so yeah 
He was saying this firebending teacher, and they really didn't trust him at first, and there were like a bunch of funny bits about that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, just, I'm just saying things. <laughs> it's well, a good show. You should all watch it. Pretty incredibly, um, a uh, a viewer here with the YouTube's username of Zuko needs therapy, not honor, just popped in. So true. And asked a question about. Uh, What's your favorite medium to mix with oils? And I share that you're using a combination of linseed and alkyd. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, how amazing is that? Oh my god, Zuko, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> I'm so overwhelmed. <laughs> like, one day it's like Mike Pence and like Trump in 2024, and another day it's like Zuko. <laughs> That's crazy. Also, please watch where you're stepping as you're painting. Uh, you're try. good, no worries. <laughs> Sorry. And Alex said maybe the real honor was the friends he, he made along he, the way. Yeah. <laughs> so true. And Darkstar said, I don't know if that person's username is just like an extreme coincidence or perfect timing, lol. That's actually like insane. <laughs> yeah, how that is. I'm pretty what? taken aback right now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Robert, I'm asking her to watch her step because, so that she's, um, you're good, mate, where you are. Okay. Um, so that we can see what she's painting, because sometimes, you know, it's very natural to paint head on, but because we have a camera trying to capture what she's doing, she has to paint sort of sideways, which is just a very unnatural thing, and so I need to remind her from time to time. And when you're standing, it's very easy to kind of just naturally sway back and forth. Mm -hmm. And it is 9.10, by the way. Okay. How do you feel about your progress so far? Um, definitely going to have to rework it later. <laughs> but um, it's not bad. Like, it's legible as, like, feathers that are layered. So mm -hmm. that's what matters, like, the structure and the values of overall. Mm -hmm. um, Did you have to mix separate values and colors for the transparent part of the wing that's showing i know it's technically all transparent but it it appears especially transparent like right here. behind right in front of the figure right right um not really i think well like this bit's definitely like a bit warmer there's some green and blue in there um to kind of match with the cooler tones in the back as well but um these are also like relatively cooler colors. So they're not like that different, really. Mm -hmm. um, there are some bits of higher saturation, like these little bits of orange. That's just like from the effect. Um, and, but that's like, like a darker version of that is like partially visible, like up in here too, in between some of the feathers, like where they overlap. So no, it's like, I mean, my palette's very harmonized and chaotic, so um, they're not like super separate, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't plan to treat them like separately because um, it is part of like the same subject. So I want it to look harmonized. I must say, this has been a very interesting live stream. Yeah, it it's, was like really quiet, and then yeah. we just started saying things, and it's been very enjoyable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we started interpreting the betrayal painting, discovered that there's a sprained ankle about to happen, maybe it's already happened. Sprained ankle lore. And we started talking about Zuko. It's been pretty all over the place, I kind of love it. Definitely better than, I don't know, not better, it's just like different than, um, you know, always talking about like the painting or like me as an artist or whatever. Um.
Uh, Sarah Price is uh, wondering, how is May doing on her other painting? Yes, yeah, so the, uh, the portrait behind you. That one? Yeah, what's the status of that? It's finished. I just have to cut the board. Awesome. Um, you want to step back so we can kind of... Yeah, so it's... I think we showed it last time. Mm -hmm. We'll get a photo of it so we can drop it into her little portfolio scene that I have here. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, yeah, so if you notice the bottom of that has a bit of white on it, and that's, that part's going to get cut off. Um, and so then it'll be a completed portrait. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Did start a new one, um, but it's not here at the moment. And it's like, I just did the flats, so it's like not very pretty. Um, but yeah, that's the one I did like the transfer for like six hours on, like the other day. Always in motion, can't sit still. And like, because that one's so big, um, I mean, it's like really big and there are like a lot of moving parts, but I'm gonna have to like seal it a bunch of times in between, um, like working on it in different parts. So there are gonna be some days where I can't work on it. And that already happened for like the past like three days. And so I felt very like idle and irritated. And so I've already started designing another piece. Because <laughs> um, I'm aiming to finish six over the summer. So yeah, there will be new things to show you guys soon, hopefully. Yeah, May is a very prolific painter, which is really <laughs> cool. It's like every time I see her, she's working on something new or has seriously progressed one of her paintings forward. It's really awesome. Thank you. Um, Rednick asked, do U.S. Americans recover from art college debt in five years? Depends. I wouldn't know. <laughs> yeah, so we haven't gone to art college because we've gotten our training here. Mm -hmm. um, so we've completely circumnavigated <laughs> that problem. That's not a, uh, a question that uh, we get to interpret and wonder whether <laughs> the people are going to overcome that yeah. obstacle. Um, I guess N.A. Yeah. Yeah, not applicable. Um, yeah, the Evolve program, the Art Academy, that's really kind of given the education that's necessary to develop a professional career. Um, so I'm not sure what your situation is there or for anyone watching, but if you're looking at ways to get a serious education, and develop a career out of this, then seriously take a look at Evolve. Might save you hundreds, hundreds of, of thousands of dollars. Yeah. I'm gonna adjust the camera for everyone here. Sorry, I'm like trying to be sideways. It's kind of tough. Question from Sarah Price. Yes. Didn't you have a bet with the subject for the, the portrait um, to your left? Didn't you have a bet with the subject about being able to paint the shirt? Oh, um, yeah. I mean, like, informally. Um, he was just like, why would you do that? And I was like, because I can't. And he was like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah. And so it's kind of just like an ego thing, not really like a financial thing. But um, he was very impressed. I like sent him the picture, and he was like, no way. And I was like. Pull up and see. And he was like, you're too far and gas is expensive, but I'll believe you. So. <laughs> yeah. And do you have any other subjects planned for future paintings? For, yeah. So I'm working on like this family portrait right now as like a major portfolio piece. Um, also gonna, I think I, I originally intended like that science fiction illustration that I'm doing prints of to be, um, the last in like a series, so because I have like two, like, kind of similar um, paintings that I like completed before it, but like this one is just like much better than both of them, and so I think this will actually be the first 
of like a new series of three um, that will hopefully be as good or better. Um, just like in every aspect, like painting application, composition, um, everything like that. So I will have two more rival companion pieces with that illustration. So at least two more sci-fi illustrations, one big family portrait, and yeah, I think that's all for now, like in the immediately, immediate like definitive future. Um, past that, I am not 100% locked in on anything. But I do have like a number of pieces that I would like to reach in my portfolio by like the end of the year, um, the end of like next semester, etc. So I have numbers. I don't have exact compositions yet, but definitely like I already have three, three definitive things in the near future. Here's a great question from Lil Sesh. Mm. Any advice for artists in a creative slash motivation rut? Um, and everyone can chime in here to yeah. share their thoughts as well. I'd say don't force it. It's like probably the biggest thing because then you'll just make yourself like more frustrated and then that just digs you further into the hole. But also it's like if you're determined to like stay consistently creative, don't just be like, oh, I'm not feeling it today and kind of just like let yourself not engage for like a long time at once. Um, so there's like that balance in there. Um, I think another thing, like I tend to just look at other people's work a lot. Like the internet makes that like so easy. So like Instagram, Pinterest, um, even sometimes like I'll look at um, just like photography or like Renaissance paintings or just like um, stuff that's less directly relevant to the kind of images I'm working on. Um, just to like get a sense of like color palettes or like um, value combinations or compositions and stuff like that. So. Those are like the main things I do, at least. But like if it's been like a month or something, you still can't come up with something, then I would definitely just have a session where you just sit down and like make yourself sketch or create like something. So you have something like tangible to like build off of at least in the future, even if it doesn't like develop fully into its own idea like in that moment. Or just like watch a show you really like or read a book you really like or something because fan art is like very good go-to material for just like creating something, you know. Um. Yeah, that's my two cents. <laughs> I heard somebody say recently that um, like from, you know, scientific studies or, or whatever, <laughs> and I saw this on the internet, so, you know, who really knows, but it's, it's, it seemed to ring true is that um, motivation typically doesn't come first. Mm. Making the choice to do something, usually something small and practical, will help start like giving that sense of reward and purpose again and start like helping build momentum and motivation. And very rarely will it happen where motivation comes and then you want to do something. Mm -hmm. um, so when I find myself in that place, I tend to kind of just challenge myself to do like, you know, small, take small steps and enjoy the reward and victory of that. Um, even if, you know, it can be kind of easy to beat yourself up over like, oh, I, I know I could be doing more. Yeah. But sometimes I'll kind of accept, all right, well, I'm in this, this place right now. Um, and so I'm going to accept that and then set goals accordingly um, and then let it ramp up so that you know the next day I'm much more ready and uh, that has helped me a lot.
Carrie said, I take a week or so off, then come back fresh. I found my work improves a lot in the next painting by doing this. Hmm. And Mary Jo, you are asking about cutting the board. So that's the board we're referring to is the painting that's behind May right now. There's a, a little section that needs to be cut and the painting is complete. So Ritmic is clarifying, uh, sorry for my English, instantaneous painting equals painting fast with no sketch and almost no correction. So just like no sketch, I guess is the main point. And then like no correction. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so like gesture, gesture drawing, kind of that same vibe. Yeah, kind of like a, a quick a la prima approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think if you're rushing the painting, then you're going to run into some, some serious issues. Yeah. There might be a place for giving yourself like a time limit to do something. Mm -hmm. um, but I, w I wouldn't recommend it until you're at a certain level of skill where you're already understanding, you know, technical things and fundamental things. And um, like, let's say that you have a full process for painting, you make great paintings, but you need to find ways to be faster at it. Um, maybe you could try some exercises where you're painting more quickly and, and maybe loosening up and discovering what you need and what you don't need to help you loosen up and things like that. Um, but I wouldn't say that it's underrated. But that's, uh, while I am educated, it is, that is an opinion. I will say. Yeah, I mean, it's like a good skill to have to be able to capture like a big picture and just like mentally to be able to be okay with like an imperfect result and like learn from it immediately to go on to like a next endeavor. But um, like, yeah, just kind of just stand alone as like everything else having its own merits and its own drawbacks as well. Like you can't make something finished like that but like that's not its intent, you know, so. Robert shared a tonal or color sketch painting where it's just about painting and accurate colors, but not accurate shapes. It, that's what Impressionism was about, basically. Like the essence of something, right? <laughs> yeah, and to that, you know, like, yeah, like as studies, they're great, right? Because, right. like, I've, I've, con I've done, um, for this painting I'm working on here, this large painting, I've done this digitally, but I've done, like, quick mock-ups to kind of see, like, okay, what... Well, like my shapes are all off, but I'm just getting a sense of the values and the colors like Robert is talking about here. And that can really help me decide what I want to go with for the bigger painting. Um, so, and Carrie said, do you prefer to do all your work by direct painting or does it depend on the subject matter if you use layers, puddling, etc.? cetera? Um, generally depends. It's supposed to depend on the subject matter, but because I'm trying to build a portfolio as fast as possible, um, direct painting generally suits it, suits that purpose better because I'm able to have like longer hours and just finish off sections of a painting um, and like not need days in between to like seal the entire painting because when you do speed painting you have to like you kind of cover like a lot of areas at once you have to seal it and then so that takes a day to dry well I have to wait for the painting to dry first so that's like a day or two and then you have to seal it and that's another layer, day or two so it's like half a week just because you have to seal a painting and like I just I feel like can't afford that, so generally I direct paint. Um, for this though, I did like break it up like a lot more, but still like at its essence direct painting, I would say. But yeah, it depends on like your intent overall, like with your work, um, and also like what the subject matter is. Um, definitely, like some subjects are better suited to some techniques, but that doesn't mean it's like exclusive. Um, it's not like there's always a single right answer for how to tackle something. Mm -hmm. And it is 9.30, just so you know. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
I am curious about what your stopping point plan is here. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, guess we'll find out soon. Remember last time when I thought it was going to end and then it like didn't? That might happen again. Who knows? <laughs> Sarah Price said, I'm looking forward to learning puddling. The effect is so beautiful. Puddling's cool. It's um it's less about like an actual applicable technique, like with the paint. I think. At least based on my understanding, it's less about that than like um like the concept of paint being like like the process of painting being additive, like we're constantly like putting colors on top of each other in different shapes and orientations in order to get a certain effect. So I find that quite enjoyable. Mm -hmm. And it would actually complement the Alla Prima instantaneous painting that Rhythmic is describing as mm -hmm. well. That's awesome, Sarah. Yeah, Sarah said, I'm, I'm loving being in block four, but excited about everything that's coming up. Yeah, definitely yeah. good to be excited about what's to come. Though I will say, you know, do take your time and enjoy being in block four, like you're saying, and, um, you know, really, ch really challenge yourself in this block because it, it does, this is all, it's all part of the foundations program, right? And these foundations, they lay the groundwork for what you'll be doing in the advanced program, so. Yeah. The higher you can push your own standards in block four, like direct painting, like that sets the standard, like for a lot of what you do going forward. Mm -hmm. Because they're like the mentality is like directly render everything you see, like as best you can on the first try, you know? And so if you're able to hold yourself to a really high standard for something that like direct, um, that's like really good for you going forward. So definitely take your time. Um, yeah, that's my two cents. Mm -hmm. Robert is asking, what type of bird is that wing? Um, I looked up angel wing, so I'm not sure. <laughs> maybe a swan, maybe, probably. Or someone asked me if this was like a real bird that I like found or bought or something. I was like, no, that's horrific. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I did look up like eagle wings or owl wings too, because those tend to have like more like patterning and texture. Um, but I didn't want like too much going on. So I think this is like nice. <laughs> People are sharing their progress here. Carrie said, I'm stuck halfway through block three. Can't wait for block four. And Darkstar said, haha, Carrie, you were right about feeling like a total newbie in the beginning of block three. Carrie said, yeah, it really wrecked my confidence for a while. Yeah. <laughs> 
Dark Star said, yeah, I feel a little too, dragging my feet through it. Hmm. And keep pushing through. It's oh, there for a reason for you. And it's preparing you for the right things. Glenn said, I'm almost done with block two. Can't wait for three, then four. Nice. Yeah. Bill's in block five. He said, vacant shadows rock. Yes, they do. <laughs> technique to have saves you a lot of time and I will say that confidence does come back um, it might be just being introduced into color and managing color with all the values that you're learning um, but don't worry just again keep trusting that process you'll be totally fine we're with you every step of the way Oh, sweet. Yeah, Dark Star said, I'll be keep pushing, trust in the process. Carrie said, it all of a sudden clicks. I had a hard time with colors, but all of a sudden, my last one was spot on, and I knew what I was doing. That's really cool. It's a wonderful feeling. Sarah said, that's how I see it, too. The clarinet painting is the one that made me want to join the program. I can't believe I've made it to that level. This program is such a joy. Yeah, it's funny how it sneaks up on you. Mm -hmm. The cheesecake is a really good painting too. Okay, so I'm seeing two questions that kind of go together. Yeah. Uh, the first question oh. is how, how to it says margin the colors, but I'm guessing that's manage the colors while painting. And then the other question that goes along with it is, when I paint from a photo, this is from Robert, mm -hmm. when I paint from a photo, I just want to copy the colors as accurate as I see them. What's the best way to do that? What about painting dabs on top of the photo print out to check the color mixes? Yeah, so um, to answer the, first, the second question there, what you can do is um, you can mix the color and um, you could actually take like a strip of palette paper, for example, and then hold that tiny strip of palette paper up on top of the, um, the photograph so that you're not getting paint on top of the photograph, but that way you can see it directly in comparison to the photograph as you're working on your color matching. Um, but eventually you won't need to do that as you'll get better and better. And then, yeah, just to say that like for color, there's a reason why we teach in grayscale first it's so that you can see things for their value. And when you can kind of look at colors and understand what the value of a color is, how light or how dark it is, that really helps narrow down the color mixing process um, because you know exactly how light or how dark it needs to be. And then from there, it's simply, you know, using the right combination of shades to get the hue that you want. But really, as long as the value is spot on, your colors can be, you know, like we in, in the default program, we get them to full on accuracy, but it's really the value. Like even if your colors are slightly off, as long as your values are okay, the painting will be okay once you take the reference away. Um, but like we said, it is good to match your colors perfectly, especially when you're learning all these things so that you get really familiar with your color palette. And um, another thing that we do is we'll also have like exercises where you're, um, so you, you know, you know, you have a general idea of what value you want to go for, and then you can make very small batches. Maybe try this combination, and make a mental note of what combination you used to get that mixture, bring it to the right value. Use another, you know, then you kind of think, try a different combination of colors. So you could have like, you know, five different little tiny swatches of say like a yellow that you're going for, but they're all slightly different from each other because you use different paint from your palette there and then from those let's say five that you have you can choose the most accurate one or maybe make some subtle tweaks accordingly um, and that's a kind of a good way to then see like that way if you're thinking about it you could think well I, I you know failed four times and I got one that was really close or you could think huh I just learned five ways 
to mix yellow. And now you can see what kind of yellow you get which, with the different combinations. So you're expanding your understanding of your own palette. Um, so, I mean, which, which is another thing, is make sure you have a good palette that will give you a full color spectrum when you're mixing, which of course we provide in the Evolve program. So hopefully those, that advice helps. Uh, Poco asked, did I block Irish painter who mentioned... Yeah, you did. Yes, I did. They, they began to say some just inappropriate comments. Nothing to do with their comments on May's painting as much as just inappropriate comments in general. And uh, just did not appreciate it. So um, I didn't exactly block them. I think they still had permission to watch. But... Um, simply remove their comments from being seen on our channel, or something like that. Um, but it was just disrespectful. And so we do ask for everyone to be considerate in the comments. Let's see, Bev said, I had about a week where I couldn't do anything due to work, and now I'm sitting staring at my still life assignment <laughs> 11, block 2, and my measurements look off. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Settle back in. Um, I don't know if you were here earlier, Bev, but I was just sharing how, um, the, at the beginning of this live stream, how I become overwhelmed. Um, my own... My skills were growing, but my pressure on myself was also growing faster than my own skills. And I let that really eat away at me when really I just needed to trust the process and keep going. And so I'd encourage you to just keep plugging away. Um, maybe even, you know, like if you've already, I don't know how far you are in this assignment, if you're already painting, um, maybe you go back to get a second piece of paper and um, actually, don't take my advice. Reach out to the homework instructors if you need help on that specific assignment. <laughs> um, I'm not the best person to ask to ask those answer those questions for you, actually. So I'm gonna uh, stop talking there. But yeah, reach out to the homework instructors if you need help. But as far as like you know, encouragement goes, don't be discouraged. Um, taking that week off, it's okay. Keep going. It'll come back, and you'll be totally fine. Just let the confidence just seep back in as you take one step at a time. But do remember that you have access to all those instructors who want to help you out. Well, Robert said, how does she concentrate on mixing colors while listening to our super random questions, LOL? That's a great question. You're watching the answer. I don't know. <laughs> um, how much time do I have? It is 9.43. Okay, that's not bad. I thought we were going to say like 9.56 and I was going to be mm. like mildly upset. But okay. So I think the plan is to kind of fill out like this area, this area here, and then like most of this area here. Um, and then whatever edges or areas I don't resolve, I'm just gonna um, kind of like outline or blend into with this color that I mix, which matches the base underneath, so that it'll look complete and not like choppy. Which color was that gonna be? This one. Okay. And you're gonna do well with it? I'm going to kind of put it up against like all the edges that are next to like what I didn't cover, so mm -hmm. that it looks, so that it'll transition easily um, next time I come back to this. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and I think even in here, like some of the lights aren't like, um, I haven't mixed some of them because I was only aiming on doing the shadows today. So I'm just going to fill them with this so that it blends easily um, when I paint on top of it. Mm -hmm. Just something I said I was going to do um, for the figure in the back, but I didn't. So I'm learning my lesson and I'm doing it properly this time. 
<laughs> sort of like creating an, a new underpainting for yourself. Yeah, yeah. That's very light. Okay, go darker. That's also dark. Okay. Um. <laughs> I wanted to play around with the colors a little bit more like as I was painting, but I don't think I did not have time. That's okay, because I'll paint over it <laughs> if I want to. I'm really enjoying your combination of those reds and cools and how they're playing mm -hmm. with each other. Yeah, I wanted to, like, because most of these, like, relatively gray colors are still, like, warm. I kind of wanted to, like, add more blue into them so they're... More, even more striking, but I can do mm -hmm. that in a later pass. Priority is just establishing values and giving impression of structure for tonight. So. Mm -hmm. About the Evolve program, Carrie said, Sarah, I saw those in some Block 8 paintings before joining and thought, really, we will be able to paint those? I didn't believe it until I found some students doing them. And Sarah said, exactly, students who are ahead of me still inspire me when I need to push. Yeah, and hopefully this live stream is inspiring you guys as well. <laughs> uh, Judy said, I'm in Block 6. For me, it is the hardest to learn but each painting is also the most rewarding so far. Love it and so worth every penny I spent. That's awesome, glad to hear that. Always good to get good feedback about the Evolve program. <laughs> Links in description for everyone who's watching. Carrie said, I'm just mind blown how soft those feathers look. Do they look soft? <laughs> I really can't tell I'm back here. I mean, I'm up here, so perspective is all like very close up. But yeah. Yeah, they're looking good from back here. Glad that's working out for us. Mason said, pure inspiration. No. <laughs> that's awesome. Happy to hear it. Some of the stuff I'm just like making up right now. And it's nice because the feathers can kind of be rendered like in a very particular way just by the nature of the brush stroke itself. Like it's like the material of the brush. So and how it's interacting with like the density of the paint that I have down, which is nice. Robert said, what about squinting while looking at the photo or subject to simplify a lot of details into flatter areas, but to also see the tones more accurately? Supposedly, Sargent and others always squinted. Yeah, so that's really helpful for, um, or at least for, for me and my experience. Um, I use that to really like, get a sense of the values and like, especially in seeing where is the light and where is the shadow. Um, even if there are some, which is, this is rare, but even if there are some lights that are darker than some shadows, let's say that some shadows are kind of brighter, when I squint my eyes, the lights, all of the lights will kind of seem to appear more and all of the shadows will seem to, to fade back. And so by squinting a little bit, it does approximate and it really helps like capture the overall impression and that overall impression is really key, right? Because that's what your viewers take in in the first few nanoseconds of looking at your image. And it's in those few nanoseconds that you have to convince your viewer that your painting is believable and that it's worth connecting with. So absolutely. Um, you know, you don't need to squint all the time, of course, but squinting is very helpful indeed.
Oh, cool. Sarah Price said, when I'm painting, I have the recordings of the live streams on in the background. <laughs> they help me get in the best headspace. That's cool. Nice. Just living in your studio rent free, huh? <laughs> as far as Quentin goes, Carrie said, I just take my glasses off. <laughs> yeah, hey, if that works. Whatever works. Though I, I, I'm not sure that is the same because I think something about the eyelashes filtering in the light might be a little bit different, but not so sure. It is 9.50. Times like these, you don't want to hear what time it is, right? Go, 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 go. No, I won't rush. I won't try. Ah, see, that's what happens. <laughs> um, it's okay. You're just walking in a park, May. I'm Everything walking. is fine. I'm walking in a park and I'm being chased by a swarm of bees. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing great with your positioning for the camera. I'm Much like in a lunge right now, man. <laughs> like ready to race. We're gonna fight. We're gonna fight this painting. Now that's a plot twist. Uh, that is the great question. Will May overcome this painting? Will May fight the painting? Or will she get a sprained ankle? So true. <laughs> yeah. Alex said chased through a park with a sprained ankle? <laughs> Being chased by bees? The narrative potential. <laughs> that we've discussed in this live stream is unparalleled. Maybe Zuko shows up with the power of friends to help oh you out. Gosh. If Zuko showed up, I'd just faint. I'd be so happy. <laughs> I hope that's right. It wasn't. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you guys can't see what I'm doing. You know, I might be taking this narrative too far, but since Zuko is a fire breather, he, is. he could use his fire breathing to, uh, to create just a little bit of smoke to help calm down the bees, no, which is what good. beekeepers use so that they can help manage the the hive. Sarah, you're gonna have such a good time listening to this one again. <laughs> yeah, Sarah, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts. You are the true expert of everything that's going on with what we're seeing right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah's like the real commentator over here. Yeah, I mean, like, I usually don't like watch my live streams again. I like watch the beginning. Um, Sometimes, but yeah, it's weird to me. <laughs> I was like overwhelmed with what my voice sounds like on camera. Um, yeah, it takes getting used to yeah. hearing your own voice like that. Mm -hmm. I guess it's I... because we hear like our voice inside of our own body. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Here's wisdom from Sarah. Deliver, please. You could get in the painting with the angel because there's already smoke there. Sensational. Bees and angels and parts. Don't forget the sprained ankle. Don't forget the sprained ankle. How could I forget?
speed. Where is Al it? Alex is wondering, is this thematic material for the next painting? The what? Running through a park, sprained ankle, Zuko, bees. Maybe Zuko, the not the rest. Zuko's <laughs> great imagery. Dude, if I could find a model for like a photo shoot to like actually do a real painting of Zuko, yo, I would be so excited. That would be pretty cool. That would be really cool. I think they're working on a live action. They are. So you might have lots of reference images come through pretty soon. That's very exciting. I like forgot about that. How could I? It is 9.55. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, surprise, surprise. What? From Zuko Needs Therapy, Not Honor. Yes. Hot take. Sokka's better than Zuko. Uh, denied. Denied. Opinion and that's denied. coming from that's... someone whose username is Zuko Needs Therapy, Not Honor. Why would you take that username and then, like, not have Zuko be your favorite character? I don't understand. No hate on Sokka, I'm just saying, like... Okay, just like purely in terms of painting and like relatability, like Sokka's better. I mean, sorry, Sokka's better. Sokka's, I don't know. I feel like he's, he, he has like a lot of potential, but they use him a lot as just like comedic relief. Mm. Um, so as a character, he's pretty solid, but just like uh, his role in the franchise was diminished, I believe. I'm like trying to figure out what's going on here, but I'm also like, procrastinating it by talking about, like, Avatar, <laughs> because I'm afraid. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Sorry. Uh... When I still have to fan brush this for you guys. Okay, we're probably gonna go over time slightly. Credit to Sokka, though, he does bear the burdens. He's, he's kind of like a Samwise Gamgee type of a character. Yes. He's a little more comedic relief. And everyone kind of just accepts it, that mm -hmm. he's going to be the one to just deal with all the, all the burdens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have to share this. Okay. So Zuko Needs Therapy Not Honor said, my username was either Zuko Needs Therapy Not Honor or Sokka with hair down is Bay." So I don't know, Okay, the, I, I agree with the second one. That's valid. Both are valid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if this live stream is like evolving to a new level or if it's deteriorating <laughs> with these unrelated conversations. Um, I mean, if people wanted to ask questions, they would ask, like, questions, you know, like, related yep, to absolutely. art and stuff. Mm -hmm. But if people want to talk about Avatar, like, you know, yeah. it's, like, enjoyable, too. And so I'd rather have people enjoy this and, like, have it not be super, like, relevant all the time than have it be, like, super stilted and purely educational. Because, like, I don't think I'd be able to do that either, <laughs> like, on mm -hmm. my end. If I, like, could only talk about painting. Yeah. That would be very boring to you. Um, I promise. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, from a personal note, I think this is, it's fun, right? Because we just, yeah. we're just hanging out. We're just talking, yeah, exactly. having a good time, mm -hmm. connecting, and we're here to answer those questions, like May said. But we're also happy to talk about all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Mason said, it's evolving. <laughs> nice. And he also said, is that easel that Kevin got from a friend or is it sold somewhere? So I think... Uh, he got it from a friend. Well, it is kind of both, sold. right? Because yeah. I think you can 
purchase it mm -hmm. somewhere. Mm -hmm. I'm going to type in, it's a Hughes easel. I want to say it's a 5,000 um, made of mahogany. So if you look up Hughes easel, you should be able to find something online. Um, it's an incredible easel. You're only seeing a part of it. Um, we nickname it the torture rack sometimes because it's just... I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, no. Well, I do. <laughs> It's just huge, and it could it could hold massive paintings. It looks like a guillotine. I think that's um, amazing. Yeah, the painting that May is working on here is dinky compared to the the size of the, <laughs> the painting. Even my uh, three by four painting that I'm working on is like just appropriate for the painting, but you could go much much bigger, and the easel itself is much bigger than my three by four painting. It is quite the contraption. Uh, time. <laughs> it is 10 o'clock, May. Sorry, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> if you need to be here to keep working, that is fine. There is no pressure on anyone to stay, to be here. Yeah. Um, we appreciate that you've been here during the time that we've set, which is always great. Great to talk about these things. <coughs> so, would be nice if. Uh, you do find a time to wrap up, but we are also here. And I understand, especially as another artist, that sometimes you just need to do what you have to do to get to a solid finishing point. So take the time you need. Thanks. Uh, yes, Sarah, this is the same easel Kevin used for the portrait live streams during lockdown. And Bev, uh, is asking, are all cast shadows sharp? Just need a quick reminder. Yes, as a as a rule, uh, I believe you're still in block one. So yes, all cast shadows are sharp. And all your form shadows will have gradients. And that's one of our rules for learning. Um, it's not a rule that you have to apply in future paintings, but for block one, it's a rule that we use to really help you understand how these things work and cast shadow should always be relatively sharp. Um, for example, like you can see um, right underneath the wing, there's a cast shadow when May uh, leans her head back for a second. <laughs> Sorry, I chose a, a, a bad spot to, to point okay. out. Um, so your hand is also blocking that same spot. Yeah, that cast shadow right there. <laughs> um, I don't know how to point to it. Can you point to it for us? Here? The cash out of from the Here. wing on the back. Here? Yeah, but the edge of it to the right there. Yeah, coming down that diagonal angle. Yeah, yeah. So that's a cast shadow, but you can see that she's put a gradient on it because there's some distance between the wing and the cast shadow there. So there is some light spilling over into that spot, um, but it is still relatively sharp compared to some of her other form shadows and, and the gradients that she would put in. And so, um, yeah, learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist is what I'll say to that. But we mm -hmm. use rules to learn, super effective, and helps the learning process go so much faster. Question from Mary Jo, is May still trying to work from dark to light on the wing? No. <laughs> <laughs> I am just trying to finish. May is painting very calmly right now. I'm so calm. She's not I'm stressing all, at all about the fact that we're going over time. I'm meditating. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not being sarcastic at all. Mm -mm. <laughs> What's sarcasm? I've never heard of her. Um. Rachel said, hey guys, painting is looking beautiful. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks, Rachel. Hi, Rachel. And Eddie said, that's Thanks a $5,700 easel. Yes, it is. Sheesh. Kevin doesn't normally splurge on things, but... When he does, he really does. Yes. <laughs> um, I don't know if you guys noticed, I think we maybe mentioned it when we did the portrait live stream of the Grandmaster in New York City, but or New York State. Um, I went up there with Kevin uh, into upstate New York to meet... Um, oh, shoot. Is it... Um, Lattimore, Andrew Lattimore, I want to say is the name. Let me confirm that. that so sounds that, familiar. 
I believe it's Lattimore. I just want to make sure I get the first name right. Because his signature is incredible. And that's what I'm remem remembering. Yes, Andrew Lattimore. Um, you can look him up online. Let's see. Yeah. So I'm just going to grab the link. So anyways, um, Kevin and I went up there together with another art student. And it was this incredible studio, what seemed to me to be in the middle of nowhere at an old textile factory, I believe. Some kind of factory. And his art studio it was like this, it was like an abandoned textile factory. And he's at the top of this thing with this beautiful window with north facing lighting and these like artifacts from um, World War II, I want to say, that he was using to like contain his medium and his paint. And he had skeletons and just he had a, um, a replica bust of um, It's uh, one, of the, one of the Venus um, statues, I believe. I'm also forgetting this name. Let's see if I can find it really quick. Anyways, it was, it was just incredible. And um, Andrew Lattimore was, um, was good friends with Kevin. He's another professional artist. And um, so they came to, to an agreement. Andrew Lattimore just wasn't using the the easel and Kevin was happy to take it off his hands. Uh, Mary Jo, yes, the, the board is, uh, it's a, like a gessoed board. I believe you got it from Lowe's or Home Depot, like a hardware store. Yeah. And uh, she gessoed it, sanded it down, prepared it, cut it. for painting, cut it down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nothing special. Oh, cool. Okay. Sarah Price said, I was recovering from COVID when you guys were doing that stream, and I watched every minute. I think it actually helped me heal. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah, you know, that was actually really important to us to do that live stream. Um, you know, the equipment that we have now compared to what we had back then, which that's all um, on our YouTube channel, um, was very different. But we really wanted to make it happen because it was during that time of COVID, and we knew that we could connect with people, especially artists. Um, who are feeling isolated during that time. So Sarah, that's really awesome to hear and I'm sure Kevin appreciates that. I'll make sure that he hears that. Oh, cool. And then Express Image Artistry said, that's when I first discovered Kevin during the lockdown painting series. Now I'm a student. That's so awesome. I'm getting there, I promise. <laughs> Question from Sandra. Yeah. Hi, May, looking great. Thank you. May, Hi, what will you do with these paintings after you have your portfolio all finished? Will you hang them at your house or what? Probably not. Hang them at my house. Um, I don't know, maybe I'll try to sell them. Maybe I'll try to put, a, put them up somewhere. Like a library or local gallery or something. I don't know. It's a great question. Figure that out when I get there, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I don't think my mom wants them that much at home. She's like, oh, you should 
have them up somewhere where like they'll be perceived by more people than just like me and like your dad. I'll probably try to find a public place to hang them. But maybe I'll sell them. I'm not too emotionally connected with them, I think. Because like when I made them, it was like with the intent of like having them perform rather than like be super personal or anything. So. Something I didn't think I'd be capable of. <laughs> but. When I was younger, I was always like really attached to everything I made, um, even if it was like literal garbage. <laughs> Sandra said, that is a great idea. Public display will be a great advertisement. Mm. Hope so. Out of media. <laughs> What's that? Running out of media. It's okay. Mm. Um, are you going to need more, or are you wrapping up? I think I'll be okay, because I'm just going to use, like, two colors. They're very similar, like, going forward now. Okay. So. Uh, Robert is asking, is there an evolved brick-and-mortar gallery also? There is not. There should be. That's a good idea. Um, we have a live, like a, actually, I think there's there's one happening right now where our students are submitting their paintings over to Piper, who's the head instructor of Evolve. And there's gonna be like a, a gallery that's gonna come up soon. But we also did one previously in around Christmas time. So Robert, if you hang tight, I can look up, look up that link. And I kinda, I just recorded a video of myself walking through that live gallery so that it kinda had some longevity and was up on YouTube. And Kevin is talking about the Evolve community as, as that's going on. You can see the, the work of the Evolve students just from that period of time. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, virtual gallery is a virtual gallery, gallery online. So what I'm trying to do is just use the color that matches the flat to kind of um, go around the edges of everything I've put down so that it'll transition easier later. And obviously it's not like, it's pretty close to the color I mixed already. That's like the flat right now, but obviously it's not super close to a lot of the colors I have down. So I'm gonna have to go in and put kind of buffer shades there. Not in a very precise way, but um, yeah. Like the intent is to make transitions easier going forward. Cool. Mm -hmm. Question from Alex. Yeah. Would you do a gallery or show at some point in the foreseeable future or feature your art somewhere? I would love to, um, but that stuff is like hard to make happen <laughs> unless you have like very good connections um, obviously, I mean, I'd love that. It's like I've... You could definitely make it happen <laughs> if you set a goal to it. Yeah. Um, maybe after I do my portfolio, I'll focus on that, like, a bit more. Because, um, like, for me, like, I work on, like, one or two paintings at a time, and then I finish them, and I kind of put them to the side, and they're just, like, in, like, a little stack at the corner of the school here. <laughs> um, and, and so, like, sometimes it's, like, 
I, I forget like how much I've created. <laughs> um, and like, I forget how much time I've spent. And because like, it just becomes normalized to me as like part of my schedule, like what I do every day, every week. Um, and so I, like, it's easy to lose track of like how far I've come, I guess, and how much I've created. And so it'd be nice to be able to see everything <laughs> instead of having it sit in a pile. Um, mm -hmm. Especially because a lot of the images are like, you know, they're like dynamic, they're illustrations, they're like stuff I kind of put time and effort into like composing and everything. So it'd be nice to see all my ideas kind of together. <laughs> Is a really, uh, what's the word, appropriate question from Sandra. Mm. So you're preparing to stop for the night, but how do you decide where to stop? Um, well, I know this is the final step, like what I'm doing now. It's like preparing it for the next pass, where I'm uh, making these edges blend in with what's underneath it already. Um, so the transitions are easier. Um, and yeah, that's kind of it. This is just like the last stage I will be working at. So. You can see it's like not super precise. I'm kind of blending into what's down as well as putting this value, I mean color down like by itself. Um, Oh yeah, and then after this, I'll fan brush everything, so. Mm -hmm. So hopefully a lot of the glare is gone from the texture of the paint once I do that. It's pretty cool. Sarah Price and Sandra both have their paintings in that virtual gallery I mentioned. Nice. Um, question from Mary Jo. Yes. Um, she's wondering if you can cut down gesso board. Uh, yeah. Yep. You need like a saw though, something electronic and powerful. Yep, and precise, right? Yes. Which is where why it's important. So be careful. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's possible. It's very possible. Yeah. Sorry. Table saw is certainly the most convenient and easiest to use for this. Make sure you wear goggles and stuff. If you use that. <laughs> but I've used uh, circular saws and other things. I'm almost there, guys, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I will say if you don't have a table saw, then I highly recommend you cut down your painting before you paint it so that you can really make sure that you have a nice clean edge and, and you're not eating away at any of the paint in the process. So I'm just going around the edges down here. I lied, there is another step. <laughs> um, with like a color slash value that I mixed already that um, fits between the color, the value and color of the feathers. 
as well as um, like the figure underneath. So the edges aren't super sharp and it has like a little bit of a colorful like edge to it. Um, more atmospheric, so it feels less like a cutout. leaning on the easel, so it's making funky sounds. I promise it's not me. Did you tape the back of the painting to the easel? How is it standing up right now? Oh, I just stuck it behind. The, the painting? Yeah. What do you mean? This? Yeah, oh, like no, I didn't. I actually, that's a great question. Did you put it up or did Kevin put it up? I think Kevin put it up oh. earlier today. Kevin's a wizard. Maybe or it's I just imagine tape. there's tape on the back. <laughs> there's probably tape on the back. Because there's actually, if you notice, there's no, uh, usually there's a brace that would rest on the top and yeah. kind of use the gravity to hold it in place, but it's uh, flush up against, thanks to Kevin's ingenuity, always looking out for us. <laughs> thanks you, Kevin. I don't even know if you're watching. <laughs> okay, oh, that's, that's better. Yes, Becky, we can get close up on those, on those feathers in just a moment. Once I'm done with them, you can have a close up. <laughs> um, okay. Sorry, Daniel. <laughs> if you don't mind just watching where you're standing, thank you. Okay, okay, okay. Fan brushing. Mm. Yeah, let's go over the whole thing. Can they see? I can, I can actually just stand up. This <laughs> yeah, I'll zoom out for everyone. I was bending down to see the texture of the paint down here, make sure it's all smooth. And then it's smooth enough because doing a second pass over it to pull everything in the same direction is always some kind of overlapping um, every brush stroke a little bit. 
We weren't missing anything. Yay, okay, I think that's it. <laughs> All right, sorry for keeping everybody for so long. Um, no worries, we're glad to watch you paint. We did it, we did it guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, awesome. Hope that was enjoyable. Um, lots of side conversations, but I had fun too, hopefully you guys did. <laughs> yeah, and so, yeah. absolutely. And also, a friendly reminder about the print that May is offering for sale. Is this your first print that you're offering for sale ever? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Jump on the, the debut Maisang illustration print train. <laughs> <laughs> that would yeah. be very cool of you, and I would appreciate it very much. First <laughs> ever print from up-and-coming artist May Jung. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. <laughs> now that you say it like that, it feels like a lot cooler. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true, right? It is true. It's very cool. And it's a I phenomenal think. piece, too. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Get my, get my favorite piece at the moment for the first time ever of me, if you want. <laughs> yeah. Are there any more questions? Yeah, any anything? final comments on questions? I'm just getting some thank yous. Looking beautiful, mm -hmm. May. Thank you. Great job, May. Awesome. Yeah, we are we are well over, so <laughs> let's end this. All right. <laughs> if good you night. have any comments, yeah, good night everyone. If you have any comments, just drop them into the recording of this live stream and I'll be able to respond to you that way. But once again, thank you all for coming out. We really appreciate you spending the time with us and allowing us to do these and make them worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you. Take care everyone. Good night.